the commentators, and the mind mistakes this reflection in the mirror, which is distorted due to the transformations of the Gwas, to be the real self. Purua does not change or transform, Buddhai does. Therefore, it is said, says Vyasa, that although Purua is the experiencer and does not change or pursue the objects of the senses, it appears to do so by its identification with the transformations of Buddhai, which does change and does pursue the objects of the senses. Indeed, it is only when Buddhai takes the form of the objects of the senses, the Pratyayas, noted here, CI. 10 that these objects become known to Purua via the medium of Buddha. And it is only Purua who can inherently know, says Vijanabhiku, Buddha does not know, that is to say, is not conscious of the objects of the senses that it is processing and that it exhibits to Purua. One might analogize that the software of a computer is not conscious of the material that it is processing and that it exhibits on its screen. As the computer needs a witness to know the data, so does Buddha. Thus, as a result of being identified with Buddha, Purua appears to assume the qualities of Buddha. The consciousness of Purua, although not in reality changing, witnesses or follows as a spectator the transformations of Buddha and therefore rests on, is aware of, each object that comes into the sphere of the ever changing Buddha. Whatever Buddha is transformed into is colored by consciousness says Vekaspati Misra, as a result of their contact. Although the moon is not transformed into water, he continues, it appears to be so due to its reflection in water. This Vedantic analogy works well, water in a lake or an ocean is transformed or agitated by waves, ripples, foam, etc. When the moon shines upon this disturbed surface, its reflection also becomes rippled and agitated due to the disturbed surface of the water. Ignorance is mistaking the disrupted reflection to be the true moon. Due to ignorance, Purua is misidentified with the disturbed reflection of Buddha, which is taken to be the real self. Like an echo, says Vijanabhiku, a sound that emanates from a source and then bounces off an object to return back to that source in somewhat distorted fashion, the consciousness of Purua bounces back from Buddha in the form of a distorted reflection, and thus Purua becomes aware of the disturbed Buddha along with its bhava, or quality, of ignorance. The essay Kyakarikas speaks of Buddha as having eight bhavas, virtue, knowledge, non-attachment, potency, and their opposites, including ignorance, xxiii. Buddha thus becomes aware of ignorance even though the ignorance is not in Purua which, by definition, is pure awareness but rather in Buddha. Not only does Purua appear changed due to the symbiosis, but inert Buddha appears to be conscious due to being energized by consciousness, continues Vijanabhiku, just as sunlight falling on the sea makes the sea appear to be luminous. Like the sun. Verse XX of the Sakya Karaka states that that which is unconscious appears as if conscious. Therefore, Purua is witnessing not only its own reflection but one that appears to be energized, or animate, and this further enhances the tendency of misidentification. This misidentification of Purua with Buddha transformed or agitated by the three Gwas, the objects of this world, is the cause of bondage. Its freedom, says Vijanabhiku, cannot come about through the conventional means of knowledge the senses, mind, intelligence, etc since its nature is essentially different from these. It can come about only through its own nature. Its own nature is pure knowledge, that is, exclusive awareness of its own self, rather than of the objects of Prakti. Hari Harananda adds to this that the existence of Purua is evidenced by the fact that the sense of I is constant at all times. One may say, I know something, where the thing one knows pertains to whatever is being presented at any point in time by Buddha and is always changing, but the I who knows remains constant. Likewise even with the notion I know myself, the myself that is known also pertains to ever, changing Buddha one may think of oneself in many different ways throughout the various stages of one's life but the I is always constant. As soon as this I begins to know something anything then the misidentification of Buddha with Purua, the erroneous notion that Purua is Buddha, has occurred, 
since all knowable things are the products of prakti. All knowledge thus requires the presence of the overseer, purua, and of something seen, an object in prakti. This misidentification of the seer and the seen, continues Hari Harananda, is the product of ahakra, the ego. As a result of this misidentification, the distinction between purua and buddhai is not perceived in ordinary consciousness. Buddhai resembles purua to some extent, and vice versa. Inanimate buddhai appears to be animate because it is energized by the consciousness of the animate purua, and the unchanging purua appears to be ever, changing and mutable because its consciousness pervades the ever, changing and mutable buddhai, hence Vyasa's statement that they are neither the same nor different. 2. 21 Tad, Artha Eva Diasitam Tad, is the seer, Purua S, Artha, Purpose, Eva, only, Diasya, of the knowable, of that which is seen, Atma, essential nature, existence the essential nature of that which is seen is exclusively for the sake of the seer. The seen, that is, the knowable Buddha, and ultimately Prakti herself, exists only for the sake of Purua, who is the seer, reiterates Vyasa and is thus dependent on another, not on itself. As to 18 informed us, the purpose or function of the scene, Prakti, is to provide either experience or liberation to Purua, and this purpose is fulfilled when experience or liberation has been attained. The nature of experience consists of pleasure and pain, and pleasure and pain are not conscious of themselves, they are experienced by an other. This other is Purua. Therefore, the purpose of the scene is not for itself but for the seer, just as the purpose of a bed, continues Vijanabhiku, is for the sleeper, not for itself. Or, as Vekaspati Misra puts it, the relationship of Purua and Prakti is like that of the king and his possessions. Since Prakti has nothing more to do once its purposes are fulfilled, asks Ramnanda Sarasvati rhetorically with an eye to the next sutra, does this mean that, deprived of its function, Prakti would no longer be perceived? Might it even cease to exist? 2. 22 Nitratam Prati Nam AP Anam Tad, Anya, Stravkta, Accomplished, Fulfilled, Artham, Purpose, Prati, Toward, With Regard to, Nam, Destroyed, API, Although, Anam, Not Destroyed, Tad, That, Anya, other Purus, Strav, because of being common although the scene ceases to exist for one whose purpose is accomplished the liberated Purua, it has not ceased to exist altogether, since it is common to other not, liberated Purus. This sutra situates the yoga tradition as realist, the view that the world is objectively and externally real irrespective of whether we perceive it, as opposed to idealist, the world is not objectively or externally real but a product of the mind, indeed, Dasgupta uses the term reals for the quas. 44 Putanjali and the comment Ariel tradition will take some pains to refute the idealist viewpoint in chapter 4. The scene may have accomplished its purpose, to Artha, for the fortunate successful yogi who has attained liberation, and thus may cease to exist, Nam, for such a soul but only in the sense that the liberated soul ceases to be aware of it, it has not accomplished its purpose for all other Purus, says Vyasa. It needs to provide objects of experience for everyone else. Therefore, it still has a purpose and does not cease to exist, and am. Color may not be seen by a blind man, says Vekaspati Misra, but it does not cease to be, since it is seen by those who are not blind. In this sense, the conjunction between the seers, in the sense of the totality of Purus, and the scene is said to be eternal, because the Purus are innumerable, so one need not posit the hypothetical possibility that eventually all Purus will become liberated, causing Prakti to become redundant due to an absence of Purus needing experience. This sutra is important to the yoga school, Vijanabhika points out, since otherwise its opponents might question its tenets such as that Prakti is eternal, creation is ongoing, and Isvara is eternally sovereign. Moreover, the commentators are motivated by the sutra to argue the position of the Yoga Enskya schools, 
which posit an eternal plurality of Purus, whether in the liberated or non-liberated state, in distinction to the Advaita, or non-dualist, school of Vedanta, which holds that the plurality and individuality of the Purus exist only in the non-liberated state of ignorance. This particular school of Vedanta posits that upon attaining enlightenment, the Purua, more typically referred to as Atman by followers of Vedanta, realizes that all plurality and individuality is the product of illusion, and merges into the all, encompassing, non-dual, absolute truth, Brahman. To buttress their view of an eternal plurality of Purua scripturally, several commentators point to the verse in the Svetasvatara Upanishad, 4. 5. That speaks metaphorically of a nanny goat, Prakti, whose nature is that of the Gwas and who produces evolutes of the same nature, being enjoyed by one passionate billy goat, Purua, but abandoned by another billy goat who has finished enjoying her. This resonates with Patanjali's sutra here. Just because one billy goat may leave the nanny goat, she nonetheless remains to be enjoyed by another billy goat, one Purua may become liberated, but all the other unliberated Purus remain experiencing Prakti. Therefore, whether in the liberated or non-liberated states, there must be a plurality of Purus, and each one must be individual. This is the view of all six schools of classical Hindu thought except the sub-branch of the Vedanta school, Advaita Vedanta. But what about the numerous verses in the Upanishads that seem to imply the oneness of all Atmans? The commentators ask, Vijanabhika quotes the Markhand.iapura, XXXVII. 42, to exemplify this notion of oneness as plainly as possible, just as the ether, although one, may exist as divided into many in pots, jars, and water, containers, so I, and the mighty armed king of Kasi and others are divided into different bodies with physical distinctions but are one Atman. One could point to numerous similar verses in the Upanishads. Perhaps the most famous are a series of verses from the Shandogya Upanishad, 6. 9-13, such as, these rivers, sun, the easterly ones flow to the east, and the westerly ones to the west. Coming from the ocean, they merge back into the ocean. They become that very ocean. When they are in that state, they are not aware that I am this river, I am that river. In the same way, Son, all creatures, upon attaining the existent Brahman, do not think, we are attaining Brahman. Whatever they were in this world a tiger, a lion, a wolf, a boar, an insect, a moth, a gnat or mosquito they all become Brahman. The finest essence in this world, that is the self of all this. That is truth. That is the Atman. That is who you are. Do not such verses point to one ultimate Atman that is perceived as being divided only as a result of ignorance? The enlightened yogi sees that all differences are the product of Ahakra and Buddhai, says Vijanabhiku, and that therefore all Purus are one, in the sense that they have the same essence, but this does not mean that there is factually only one Purua metaphysically. The myriad Purus are identical in the sense that their true nature transcends all distinctions, which are the product of Prakti and Hergwas, but this does not mean that they become identical in the sense of losing their individuality upon attaining liberation, nor that they merge into one ultimate Atman slash Brahman. One must keep in mind here, and indeed, Vijanabhika reminds us, that he is also a Vedantin who has written a commentary on the Vedanta Sutras, in which he has already critically discussed the one Atman theory of the Advaitin non-dual school of Vedanta. If there were only one Atman, continues Vijanabhiku, how could some Atmans be liberated and others still in Sasra? A number of the commentators draw attention to this argument, which also surfaces in the Vedanta schools opposing the Advaita viewpoint, if there were ultimately only one Atman as the Advaita school posits, then when any one Purua attains liberation, so would all other Puruas, since according to the Advaita school, they are all in reality one Purua slash Atman. In other words, if one Purua became liberated by realizing that all distinctions among Puruas were illusory and that all Puruas were in actuality one undivided Atman, then, with the ignorance of duality removed, 
there would no longer be any more divided Atmans or independent Purus. If one responds that the realization of the oneness of Atman applies only to the liberated Purua, but not to the other non-liberated Purus, then one has implicitly accepted a duality in the supposed oneness of Atman, a duality between liberated and non-liberated Purus. Such a conclusion would be awkward for the defenders of this position, say the commentators, contradicting the non-dualistic position of the Advaita school but approaching the position of the Yoga school. Vijanabhika continues to argue that not only are individual Puruas different from each other, but the Supreme Purua, God, is different again from all the individual souls. He points to the Vedanta Sutras, Brahman is greater than embodied beings because of the statement of difference between them, too. 1.22, and the embodied. Souls are parts of God because of the statement that they are different, too. 3.43. Patanjali has anyway already established that Isvara is a distinct Purua and superior to other Puruas. 2. 23 Sva, Svami, Aktiya Svara Papalabdi, Hitusayagasva, the possessed, Svami, the possessor, Skdiya, of the powers, Svarapa, nature, true form, Upalabdi, understanding, Hitu, the cause, Sayaga, conjunction, contact, association the notion of conjunction is the means of understanding the real nature of the powers of the possessed and of the possessor tying the verses in this chapter together as touched upon in 2 15 and echoing the four noble truths of buddhism the theme of this second Buddha chapter is suffering the cause of suffering the state beyond suffering and the means to attain this state specifically two. 1 to 14 were dedicated to the immediate causes of suffering on a psychological level, the cleases and their consequences, 2. 15 to the reality of suffering itself, 2. 16 to future suffering that can be avoided, 2. 17 to the cause of suffering on a metaphysical level as the union, sayaga, between the seer, dra, and the seen drasaya, 2. 18 to 19 to the seen, 2. 20. To the seer and the state beyond suffering, and 2. 21 to 22. To the seen again. This sutra through 2. 27 will deal with Sayaga, union, the metaphysical cause of suffering, and Sayaga's removal, and the remainder of the chapter will be devoted to the means to accomplish this. This sutra was composed with the intention of explaining the nature of the conjunction, or association, sayaga, between prakti and purua, says Vyasa. Purua is the possessor, svami, and he is conjoined with that which he possesses, sva, namely prakti and her objects, the scene of the previous sutra, for the sake of experience. Worldly experience means perceiving the scene, and liberation means perceiving the real nature of the seer. Ignorance is the cause of the conjunction between the seer and the seen, and true knowledge dispels ignorance and is therefore the cause of liberation. Strictly speaking, continues Vyasa, true knowledge is not the real cause of liberation because when ignorance does not exist, bondage does not exist, and so technically it is this absence of ignorance that corresponds to liberation. It is because knowledge removes ignorance that it is said to be the cause of liberation, but it is actually the indirect cause of liberation. Vijanabhika points out that true knowledge, or discrimination, operates right up until the immediate moment prior to liberation. He reminds his readers that discrimination is still a product of the material intelligence, but full liberation involves complete separation between Purua and Buddha. This is the difference between Savija and Nirbhaja Samadhis. With an eye on the next sutra, Vyasa turns his attention to different views on what constitutes ignorance. The synonym he uses for ignorance here is Adarsana, the lack of perception, of the real nature of the Purua. He lists the following possibilities, which are further discussed by the commentators. 1. Is ignorance the result of the play of the Gwas? This, says Hari Harananda, is correct insofar as ignorance continues for as long as the quas are active, but it doesn't explain the cause of ignorance any more than heat in the body explains the cause of fever. 2. 
is ignorance due to the mind, which fails to modify itself into the true object of knowledge, that is, the knowledge of the distinction between Purua and Prakti, even though this object is present before it? This possibility is of limited value, says Hari Harananda, like saying, illness means to be unwell. 3. Does ignorance spring from the Gwas, which fail to produce the true object of knowledge, namely, discrimination, even though this is latent within them? The same limitations from the previous option apply to this possibility. Another problem with this type of view, says Akara, is that since the Gwas are eternally in flux, if ignorance were a product of the Gwas, it too would be eternal and so there would be no liberation. 4. Does ignorance remain dissolved as latent saskras in the Gwas of Prakti at the end of each creative cycle, becoming reactivated in the next creative cycle, at which time it produces an appropriate mind to serve as its substratum or container. This position, say the commentators, is acceptable to the yoga school and is discussed further in the next sutra, but it does not explain ignorance. 5. Is ignorance the latent impetus that impels movement in prakti itself? The same objections apply here. 6. Is it the very power and capability of prakti to reveal herself to Purua that is the ultimate cause of ignorance? This option, says Vijanabhiku, is a variant of item 3. Vijanabhiku quotes a charming verse from the S.A. Kikarikas, LXI, personifying Prakti when her game is up and she has been seen by the enlightened Purua for what she is, the other one Prakti thinks I have been seen. 7. Is ignorance the characteristic of both Prakti and Purua? Prakti is inert, lifeless matter, but its evolut buddhai appears to be ignorant due to being animated by the presence of Purua, likewise, Purua appears to be ignorant due to its awareness of Buddhai, even though, in its pure state, it does not contain either ignorance or knowledge. 45 It is only when the power behind knowledge contacts the objects of knowledge when the consciousness of Purua shines on Prakti and her manifestations and is reflected back to Purua that ignorance is produced, so is ignorance the product of both? The problem with this, says Hari Harananda, is that it may be correct, but it doesn't explain ignorance, it is like saying sight is dependent on the sun, which doesn't explain sight. 8. A final opinion is that ignorance is ultimately and paradoxically knowledge itself. To know, after all, is to know something. All things are pyrktic. Therefore, knowledge of things occurs only when Purua is joined with Prakti. There are thus many views on ignorance, says Vyasa. They all contain some element of truth. The common denominator of all them is the conjunction of Purua with the Gwas of Prakti. Ultimately, the origin of ignorance remains mysterious in all Indic philosophical schools, indeed, it is considered beginningless, and thus the question of its origin is bypassed altogether. In the theistic schools, it is a power of Isvara, God. 2. 24 Tasia Hitura Vidya Tasia, of it conjunction, Hitu, the cause, of Vidya, ignorance the cause of conjunction is ignorance. Vakaspati Misra and Vijanabhiku elaborate somewhat on the fourth possible cause of ignorance outlined in the previous sutra. Creation in Hindu cosmology is cyclical. At the end of each cosmic cycle, all manifest reality, the world, and the evolutes of Prakti, dissolve back into their original source matrix along with the souls in Sasra the Puruas who have not attained liberation and remain there latent and inactive until the next cosmic cycle begins anew. This primordial soup, called Pradhana, thus contains all the Saskras from all the Siddhas of all the individual. Individual Puruas that had not had a chance to fructify during the last cycle. 46 At the beginning of the new cycle, these saskras reactivate and cause Pradhana to produce an individual siddha for each Purua appropriate to the specific saskras possessed by that same Purua at the end of the last cycle. The Purua is thus like a fish trapped in a net of its previous saskras and karma, says Ramnanda Sarasvati. As a result of the Purua being reconnected with the siddha, its previous saskras, most notably the saskra of ignorance, i.e. The misidentification between the Purua and Prakti, re-exert their influence. 
In other words, the Purua picks up where it left off. The point is, from this perspective, that it is the Saskras that cause ignorance. This cycle of creation and dissolution is eternal for the yoga school until liberation occurs, Sasra has no beginning, but it has an ending. Since the eternally of this cycle is axiomatic, the yoga school avoids having to account for any primordial Saskra of ignorance. That may have activated the whole cycle in the first place. When intelligence contains the Saskras of ignorance, says Vyasa, it remains active in the realm of Prakti and thus does not produce discrimination about the true nature of Purua. Saskras impel the intelligence to perform the first of its two functions, as expressed in 2. 18, namely, to provide experience of Prakti, and it is this that is the cause of bondage. Intelligence ceases its activity only when it has attained its alternative and ultimate function, which is to provide discrimination about the distinction between Purua and Prakti as was discussed in some detail in I. 50, the Saskra of discrimination overpowers all other Saskras. When this happens, ignorance, avidya, the cause, hechu, of bondage, is removed, and ignorance, we recall, is the support of the other klesas, obstacles, too. 3 to 4, so they, too, dissolve. In other words, Complete liberation occurs only when intelligence first provides discrimination and then ceases to act altogether. Although discrimination, a function of buddhai, is initially indispensable in attaining the goal of yoga, as long as it remains active, Purua is still connected with buddhai, and thus complete liberation is not realized. But discrimination eventually completely destroys ignorance and thus its own base, like fire destroys its own fuel says Harry Harananda. This results in Asamparjanata, Samadhi, the final goal of yoga. One might argue, says Vyasa, that this claim that full liberation occurs only after discrimination has dissolved itself is rather like an impotent man who, when asked by his wife why she does not have children as her sister has children, replies that he will beget children in her after he is dead. If intelligence cannot provide liberation while it is alive and active, why should one believe that it will do so after it becomes lifeless and inactive? Vyasa affirms, again, that full and final liberation occurs precisely when the intelligence ceases to act. Intelligence ceases to act when ignorance is removed. And ignorance is removed by knowledge. In other words, bondage is caused by ignorance, ignorance is removed by knowledge, the discriminatory aspect of intelligence, and then intelligence, having performed its grand finale, ceases to operate, and the full freedom of Purua occurs. Thus, intelligence and knowledge are not the direct cause of liberation, but by removing ignorance, they are the indirect cause. 2. 25 Tad, Abhavitsayak Bite Bohanam Tad, D. Kivalyam Tad, Avid Ignorance, Abhavit, from absence, removal, sayaga, conjunction, abhidva, absence, removal, hanam, freedom, escape, liberation, tad, that, day, of the seer, kaivalyam, absolute freedom, liberation by the removal of ignorance, conjunction is removed. This is the absolute freedom of the seer. Keeping our eye on the ball thematically, in two. 15 Vyasa identified four aspects covered by the science of yoga, sasra, the cause of sasra, liberation from sasra, and the means of liberation from sasra. This sutra discusses the third aspect of yoga, liberation, or freedom from suffering and its cause. Freedom, hanam, is the eternal cessation of bondage, says Vyasa. This occurs when ignorance is fully removed, as a result of which the conjunction, Sayaga, between Purua and Budhai, the cause of suffering, is removed in other words, says Vyasa, Purua never gets mixed up with the Gwas again. When the cause of suffering has been removed, suffering disappears, and Purua is established in its own true nature. This is liberation, referred to in the Sutra and elsewhere as Kaivalyam. 47 Kaivalyam is usually translated as aloneness, 
in the sense that the Puru has severed itself from Prakti and her effects and is now situated in its own autonomous nature, but is perhaps better understood as wholeness. The term Kavalan, one who has attained the state of Kavalya, is most commonly used in the Jain tradition to refer to an enlightened being. 2. 26 Vivka, Pyatir Aviplava no Pyavivka, Discrimination, Kitty, Discernment, Aviplava, Undeviating, Undisturbed, Hana, Freedom, Liberation, Upya, The Means. The means to liberation is uninterrupted discriminative discernment. If suffering is eliminated by the removal of its cause, ignorance, and this results in Purua being established in its own true nature, then what is the means, Yopaya, to accomplish this? Asks Vyasa rhetorically, as he prepares to discuss the fourth aspect of the science of yoga, the means of liberation. The means indicated here by Patanjali is Vivka, Pyati, discriminative discernment. Vivka, Vyasa reiterates, is defined as the cognition of the distinction between Buddhai and Purua, but as long as false knowledge has not been removed, discrimination remains shaky, false knowledge, Vijanabhika reminds us, consists of saskras of ignorance, avidya, which keep arising in the mind. Akara quotes a verse here, as unrefined gold does not shine forth, so the knowledge of an immature person attached to the world does not shine forth. 48. When false knowledge becomes like a burnt seed that is incapable of sprouting, says Vyasa, or, put differently, when the sattva of the intelligence has been cleansed of the dirt of rajas, then cognition attains a state of utmost clarity. At this point, the pure flow of discriminative discernment can proceed unchecked. Therefore, concludes Vyasa, the path to liberation, namely, the disassociation of Purua from Buddhai, occurs when false knowledge is destroyed like burnt seeds. Vijanabhiku adds to this that it is Vivka, Pyati, discriminative discernment itself, that burns the seeds of false knowledge, at which time all latent saskras of ignorance become like a barren woman incapable of giving birth. Vyasa notes that discriminative discernment is initially shaky, as it begins to take up the task of destroying the seeds of ignorance, the distracting saskras imprinted in the siddha that surface continually as a result of rajas and tamas. Only once this task is fully accomplished by practice, and these saskras become impotent and can no longer arise, can discriminative awareness reign supreme, and the sattva of the mind and intelligence remain undisturbed, aviplava. Then, says Akara, as seeds burnt by fire no longer sprout, so is the case with klesas burnt by the fire of knowledge, the Atman no longer encounters them. 49 Vyasa calls this stage Vasakara, Saj, which literally means knowledge that exerts control. In other words, discriminating discernment controls and eventually burns up the emergence of unwanted saskras. The commentators state that discriminating discernment is initially awakened by listening to the sastras, the sacred texts, and becomes strengthened by contemplation on their content, pursued with reverence, for a long time. It then develops further by the practice of yoga that will be outlined in the following sutras. This discrimination exposes and undermines one's attachments in the form of desires for worldly or heavenly enjoyment, continues Harry Harananda. In time, discrimination becomes so powerful that the possibility of falling into illusion again becomes completely eradicated, all wrong notions remaining like parched seeds deprived of their potency. Discrimination has now reached a state where it can flow undisturbed. With discrimination in absolute control, the siddha is no longer disturbed, and, free from distraction, can now reflect on the purua. The yogi thus approaches liberation. 2. 27 Tejya Subtata Pranta, Bhait My Prajna. Tejya, is the yogi s, Subtata, sevenfold, Pranta, Bhait My, final place, Prajna, true insight, wisdom. The Yogi's true insight has seven ultimate stages. This sutra introduces a sevenfold, subtata, division of prajna, insight. We see here that Patanjali did not specify what these seven stages were, 
which indicates that he assumed his audience would be familiar with this seven, stepped inside, and that, therefore, as noted in the introduction, Patanjali was not the founder of yoga, this type of knowledge was already in circulation. It also reinforces the point that these sutras served as manuals that required unpacking by a teacher. Upon examination of how this sevenfold division is understood by the commentators, it seems that several of these stages are essentially different ways of looking at the same state rather than actual sequential stages. With regard to prajna, it seems useful here to note Rukmani's, reassuring, observation that of the six schools of philosophy, yoga is perhaps the one school which has a profusion. Profusion of technical words used interchangeably. Thus we have Dharma, Mekha, Prasakina, Anyatha, Kyati, Sattva Purunyat, Kyati, Vivka, Vivka, Kyati, Prajna, Tumhar, Pratibha, Jainana, Ekagra, Siddha, Essay, Ja and more being used more or less in the same sense, 1997, 619. While commentators try to tease out different semantic nuances, at the very least these terms overlap considerably. Rukmani concludes that it might not always be fruitful to attempt to extract logical consistency in the usage of terms and concepts in the system, the conviction grows that this yoga is not something that can be logically described. It is a system that has brought in a number of ideas from so many sources and tried to make sense of them. Yoga was a practical school in which the various steps of prajna and asamprajanata were clearly intelligible to the adept in yoga. This is one school which has believed all along in following some well laid down yogic practices. So it is best to accept it as a discipline to be followed rather than to be understood intellectually. 623 The yogi referred to by Patanjali in the sutra refers to the one in whom discrimination has arisen says Vyasa. When the impure rajasic and tamasic coverings of the Siddha have been removed, and no further pratyayas, notions, arise in the mind of the discriminating yogi, true insight manifests in seven aspects, fifty which Vyasa lists as follows, one, that which is to be avoided, suffering, is known, and there is nothing further to be known in this regard. The very desire to know ceases, says Hari Harananda, and thus knowledge itself can cease. 2. The causes of this suffering have been completely eradicated. These causes are the klesas, ignorance, desire, etc. and the ensuing karma, as we know. 3. Vinaraya, samadhi, the samadhi of restraint, which, we recall is how Patanjali defines the entire enterprise of yoga, siddha, vitti, naraya, the removal of the misidentification of Purua with Buddhai becomes directly realized. Once this misidentification is removed, Asamprajanata, Samadhi can manifest. 4. The means to accomplish this removal of misidentification in the form of discriminative knowledge has been attained. These first four aspects, says Vyasa, pertain to liberation from action, or external events. One should note their obvious parallel to the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. The next three pertain to liberation of the Siddha. Moreover, the first four are the result of the personal effort of the Yogi, say the commentators, unlike the following. Three, which arise spontaneously. In other words, one need no longer strive to practice Yoga at this point. These final three stages represent the complete cessation of the activities of Buddha. 5. Intelligence has fulfilled its purpose, to provide either worldly experience or liberation. It has now become redundant. 6. The yogiesque was dissolved back into their causal matrix, prakti, and emerge no more, since they no longer have a function. Vyasa compares this to boulders falling from the tops of mountains when deprived of their support. Hari Harananda hastens to point out that the Gwas to which Vyasa is referring are the effects of the Gwas, not the primordial Gwas themselves, which are constituent ontological categories inherent in Prakti and thus as eternal as is Prakti. Specifically, it is the subtle body of the Siddha, says Vijanabhiku, that dissolves. 7. Purua, 
removed from the bonds of the Gwas, is now eligible to shine forth in its own pure luminous nature. This is called Kevala, Absolute Freedom. The Purua who has surpassed the Gwas and attained these seven stages of realization is known as an adept, says Vyasa. In this state, one doesn't actually realize anything, because now, by definition, one is fully detached and separated from the organ of realization or discrimination, Buddha. But just as one realizes upon awakening one has slept well, even if one cannot recall the actual experience of sleep, so does the yogi coming out of the state of Asamprajanata back into external awareness realize that this has been a state free from all suffering. There are differing views among Hindu schools as to whether this ability to remain embodied despite having attained Asamprajanata Samadhi, called Jivanmudi, liberation, while still in the body, is possible, or whether ultimate and absolute liberation can take place only after death. 51 One can attain this stage even while living, say the yoga commentators, although this will be such a person's last birth. According to Vijanabhiku, the Jivanmudda, the liberated yogi who is still embodied, may, if he or she wishes, merely witness the stages of insight, prajna, produced by Buddha. There is no sense of ahakra, of wishing to appropriate prajna or misidentify with it, as in normal consciousness. One must remember that in the yoga system, prajna is still a function of Buddha and thus a practice connection with Purua. Therefore, according to Hari Harananda, these seven steps do not yet represent the Purua being in itself, Asamprajanata, Samadhi, but the highest or final level of insight prior to this ultimate Samadhi. As has been discussed, in Asamprajanata, Samadhi, the mental function, Siddha, ceases completely and the yogi consequently ceases to function in the world. In the Jivanmutta stage, the yogi still retains the Pirktik Siddha, since, of course, by definition, embodiment entails association with the mind and intelligence, etc. Although the Jivanmutta is fully capable of discarding all Pirktik coverings and entering the state of Asamprajanata, notes Hari Harananda. The Jivanmutta, who has, by definition, no personal desire or reason to do so, might choose to remain embodied so as to help other beings who are still suffering. Obviously, says Hari Harananda, the Jivanmutta can rise above any suffering that might come his or her way due to any saskras that might still be left, by use of the Buddhai in the form of discrimination and detachment. Thus the yogi is completely free from the control of the Gwas. Vijanabhika quotes the Jita here. One who renounces all endeavor is known to have transcended the Gwas. 14. 25. In this section of the Jita, Arjuna asks Ka to describe the symptoms by which one might recognize someone who has transcended the Gwas, in other words, what are the characteristics of the Jivanmutta? It might be useful for the reader to refer to the translation of this section in I. 37. Since this material overlaps with what the commentators have to say in their commentaries for the Sutra. 2. 28. Yognanda Sati, K. Jnana, Diptair, Avivka, Kit Yoga, Yoga, Aga, Limbs, Anand, from the practice of Asati, Impurity, K, on the destruction of Jnana, Knowledge, Pti, Light, Lamp, A, up to Vivka, Discrimination, Kit, Knowledge. Upon the destruction of impurities as a result of the practice of Yoga, the lamp of knowledge arises. This culminates in discriminative discernment. Patanjali here introduces the long, awaited agas, limbs of yoga. It has by now been well established, says Vyasa, that discriminative discernment, vivka, when achieved, is the cause of removing the conjunction between purua and prakti, in other words, of removing ignorance such that liberation manifests. But what is the cause of achieving discriminative discernment? A means is required to achieve this. Milk may exist in the udders of the cow, says Vekaspati Misra, but one needs a means or process to extract it. The means presented in the Sutra of attaining discriminative discernment is the practice of the eight limbs of yoga, Yogananda, which will occupy the rest of the chapter. 
by the practice of yoga, Patanjali states, impurity, asati, is destroyed, which, Vyasa, reminds us, consists of the five klesas, obstacles to yoga, ignorance, ego, attachment, aversion, and clinging to life. The notion of yoga destroying impurities goes back as far as the Apastamba, Dharma, Sutra of the 5th and 4th centuries B.C.E, which lists 15 doas, faults, that are eliminated by its practice. 52 When impurity is removed, the light of full knowledge, Jnana, Deepti, noted in the sutra can shine forth, like the sun after the cold season, says Akara. Another way of putting this is that as the impurities of Thomas and Rajas dwindle, the luminosity and clarity inherent in sattva can manifest unimpeded. An impurity is something that intrudes on or contaminates another entity, in this case, Rajas and Thomas covering sattva, of course, sattva itself is ultimately a covering of Purua. The more the Eightfold Path is practiced, the more these impurities dwindle, and the more they dwindle, the more this light can correspondingly correspondingly increase. This increase culminates in the desired discriminative discernment, a feature of pure sattva. Just as the axe slices wood from a tree, so the practice of these eight limbs slices the impurities away from the siddha, says Vyasa. There is the widespread view that the continuity of the text comes to something of an abrupt end after two. 27. With this sutra typically deemed as initiating a new self, contained unit on the eight limbs. It is true that Patanjali does not make reference to the eight limbs prior to this point. Nor is there any explanation of the relationship among tapas, svadhyaya, and isvara, pranidhana as the three ingredients of kriya, yoga, and their occurrence as three of the five nayamas, the second limb, discussed below. And our modern notions of discursive continuity might have put the eight limbed section in a separate putta of its own, beginning with the sutra. But, again, one must be wary of submitting the cryptic sutra style to modern notions of structural structural coherence. Just as the kriya, yoga section introduced a new set of terms and conceptual analyses indispensable to explaining the mechanics, klesas, underpinning the vita such that the attainment of the goal of yoga might be better understood, so does this ensuing section dedicate itself to a necessarily more specific elaboration of the abhyasa, practice, touched upon in I. 12. As with the kriya, yoga section, this increase of detail requires new terms and categories, but now pertaining to practice, articulated accordingly with less philosophical tone and content. It is likely that Patanjali drew upon an existing tradition of eight, limbed yoga when composing his text, or modified the older tradition of six limbs, as well as a distinct tradition featuring kriya, yoga. In other words, as a systematizer of existing traditions, Patanjali might well have merged two distinct but overlapping systems. This possibility is enhanced by the fact that the relationship between the three ingredients of kriya, yoga and the identical three ingredients reappearing in the second limb of yoga, the nayamas, but now alongside two other ingredients, is not addressed by Patanjali. 2. 29 Yama, Nayamasana, Prima, Pratyahara, Dra, Dhyana, Samadayoe with Makran v Agni Yama, Abstentions, Moral Restraints, Nayama, Observances, Asana, Posture, Prima, Breath Control, Pratyahara, Withdrawal of the Senses, Dra, Concentration, Dhyana, Meditation, Samdaya, Absorption, Aa with Makran U, 8, Agni, Limbs The eight limbs are abstentions, observances, posture, breath control, disengagement of the senses, concentration, meditation, and absorption. In I. 12, practice and dispassion were presented as the means to control the vitas and thus attain samadhi, in 2. 1. Self, discipline, study, and submission to the Lord were identified as practices conducive to eliminating the klesa obstacles to yoga and attaining samadhi. The following sutras offer further prescriptions for attaining the goal of yoga. Actually, both sets of injunctions in I. 
12 and in 2. One can be located within the first two limbs, the yamas, abstentions, and nayamas, observances, practice and dispassion find correlates in the yamas, and the three ingredients of kriya, yoga are repeated verbatim under the nayamas. Akara also adds that there are other requirements of the path, such as practicing dharma, righteous conduct, and accepting a guru. The commentators save their analyses of the eighth. Items listed in the sutra for the following sutras, which take up each limb individually. One might add, here, that the notion of yoga having agas, limbs, is derived in all likelihood from the older Veda, agas. The successful performance of Vedic ritual in the later Vedic period was seen as dependent on the mastery of the six limbs of the Vedic ritual, phonetics, meter, grammar, etymology, astronomy, and ritual, mentioned in, Edachi. Muaka Upanyadai. 1.5. Likewise, the goal of yoga expressed in I. 2 is dependent on the successful performance of the eight auxiliary limbs of yoga indicated in this verse. Just as none of the Vedic limbs individually represented the goal of Vedic sacrifice, but each was an essential contributing part of it, so is the case with the limbs of yoga. 2. Thirdia is, Satyastya, Brahmakari Uparigraha Yamas, Nonviolence, Satya, Truthfulness, Astya, Refraining from Stealing, Brahmakarya, Celibacy, Aparigra, Refrainment from Acquisition or Coveting, Yam, the abstentions the yamas are nonviolence, truthfulness, refrainment from stealing, celibacy, and renunciation of unnecessary possessions. From the five yamas listed here, as nonviolence, the principal motto of Gandhi's non-cooperation approach, is the yama singled out by the commentators and Patanjali for special attention. In traditional methods of scriptural interpretation, introductory, and concluding, statements carry more weight than other statements. 53 is, is the most important yama, say. The commentators, and therefore leads the list. It seems important to note that the yamas themselves lead the list of the eight limbs, suggesting that one's yogic accomplishment remains limited until the yamas are internalized and put into practice. Vyasa accordingly takes as as the root of the other yamas. He defines it as not injuring any living creature anywhere at any time. Just as the footprints of an elephant cover the footprints of all other creatures, says Vijanabhiku, so does it as cover all the other yamas. According to Vyasa, the goal of the other yamas is to achieve us and enhance it, and he quotes an unidentified verse stating that one continues to undertake more and more vows and austerities for the sole purpose of purifying us. Although us has been defined by Vyasa as not harming any creature anywhere at any time, one must continue to perform one's dharma, duty, cautions Vijanabhiku, even though it is impossible to avoid harming tiny living entities such as bacteria or insects when one engages in activities such as bathing or cleaning. Nonetheless, one must strive as far as possible to avoid harming even an insect. Certainly, one can be very clear about the fact that eating meat, nourishing one's body at the expense of the flesh of other living beings, is completely taboo for aspiring yogis. One should avoid harming even trees, says Hari Harananda. Manu, who composed the primary Dharmasastra, law book, in classical India, states, to protect living creatures one should inspect the ground constantly as one walks, by night or day, because of the risk of grievous bodily harm, 6. 69. As an aside, but in this vein, certain communities of observant Jains, who have taken the principle of nonviolence further than any other tradition recorded in human history, are required to follow strict principles to minimize any possible violence to other creatures. For example, they are admonished not to eat root vegetables, since creatures in the soil may be harmed when uprooting these and not to engage in any farming activities, for the same reason. Needless to say, they must reject any type of military career. Observant members of this community do not cook after sunset, since insects would be attracted to the flame of the fire and perish, strain their water to remove any hapless microscopic creatures that might have fallen in, 
wear gauze over their mouth so as not to inhale any tiny airborne creatures, and sweep the road before them as they walk, again so as not to step on any creature, etc. Since embodied existence inevitably entails that one will sooner or later inadvertently harm some creature or other, no matter how hard one attempts to avoid this, the ultimate act of nonviolence performed in rare instances by exemplar genes is to fast to death, sacrificing their own life to save those of other creatures. Sacrificing one's life to save others is the definition of heroism. And, indeed, the perfected Jain Yogi is called Mahavira, Great Hero 54. This practice may seem extreme, it is of course not mainstream but performed on very rare occasions by exemplar ascetic Jain monks, but it needs to be considered within the parameters of the Jain, and Hindu, belief that all living beings contain an Atman, Purua, and all Atmans are spiritually equal. Even as our modern world respects the heroism involved in sacrificing one's life for the protection of fellow humans in recognition of a common humanity or humanness, and certain moral commentators are presently taking a hesitant step beyond the concept of human equality by grappling with the extent of our commonality with the great apes, and the moral issues this might present in our responsibilities to them, so Jains, there are similar instances among Hindu ascetics 55, extend this principle and, from their perspective, deepen it. By recognizing the common admin, ness among all beings, the sutras and the commentators do not advocate this degree of commitment to nonviolence, but at the very least, eating meat is to be shunned by anyone with even the minimum pretensions of aspiring to be a practicing yogi as understood by Patanjali. A sattvic person is empathetic and compassionate toward other embodied beings and would never countenance inflicting violence upon them, what to speak of eating their flesh. Moreover, being insightful, such a person understands the karmic consequence of violent actions, as will be indicated in 2. 34. Any involvement in violent acts of any kind requires that the perpetrator be subjected to the same violence at some future time as karmic consequence. Moreover, inflicting violence is a quality of tamas, and thus eating meat increases the tamasic potential of the siddha. Further enhancing ignorance. A vegetarian diet is non-negotiable for yogis. Nonviolence, Harry Harananda continues, also encompasses giving up the spirit of malice and hatred, since these produce the tendencies to injure others. This includes avoiding violence in the form of harsh words, or causing fear in others. This must be followed in thought, deed, and word, says Akara. The degree of violence is determined by intent acts of violence performed without malice and hatred by a normal person, he notes, such as self, defense or cutting the grass, are not the same as murdering one's parents in cold blood. But yogis avoid even retaliating in self, defense against an attacker, he says, and will shoo off a snake rather than kill it, and thus attempt to inflict as little aggression as possible on their environments. Vyasa defines truth, the second yama, as one's words and thoughts being in exact correspondence to fact, that is, to whatever is. Known through the three processes of knowledge accepted by the yoga school, sense perception, inference, and verbal testimony. Speech, he continues, is for the transferal of one's knowledge to others and should not be deceitful, misleading, or devoid of value. It should be for the benefit of all creatures, and not for their harm, otherwise it is sinful. Posing deceptively as a truthful or virtuous person causes one's downfall, he warns, therefore, one should consider these things carefully and speak only the truth for the welfare of all creatures. Akara quotes Manu here, let him not speak what is true but unkind, let him speak what is kind and not untrue. This is eternal righteousness, for 138. The commentators give a well-known episode from the Mahabharata involving Yudhahira as an example of deception. During the Mahabharata war, Dro, on the opposing side to Yudhahira and his brothers, the five Pavas, was unstoppably decimating their army. With a view to breaking his fighting spirit, Drona was misinformed that his son Asvatthama had been killed in the battle. 
In Vaikaspati Misra's rendition of the event, Dro asked the righteous son of Dharma himself, Yudhahira, who was renowned for never having told a lie, whether it was true that Asvatthama had been killed. Yudhahira answered in the affirmative, but since he was incapable of lying, he forced himself, as he responded, to think of an elephant named Asvatthama who had also been killed in the field that day. Although this resulted in a technically truthful reply to the question, since the thought in Yudhahira's mind was of an elephant, the knowledge transferred to Dro's mind was in relation to his son. Thus Yudhahira's words were purposely deceitful and misleading, as per Vyasa's definitions above, since their intention was to mislead. This led to Dro's downfall, but the deceit also caused Yudhahira's chariot wheels, which had up to that point floated above the ground due to the power of his dharma, to touch the ground. On the other hand, continue the commentators, given that the other yamas are subservient to his, truth must not cause harm to others. Here an example is introduced of a man of truth who is asked by robbers if merchants they are pursuing had passed that way, and, since he had seen them do so, replies truthfully. Although speaking the truth, his compliance with the robbers resulted in harm, his, being caused to the merchants. Therefore, this also does not qualify as real truth. This underscores Vyasa's view of the centrality of us, truth must never result in violence. In other words, if there is ever a conflict between the yamas if observing one yama results in the compromise of another then us must always be respected first. Hari Harananda applies this principle on a psychological level, us includes not always speaking bluntly and truthfully to people about their shortcomings. Here he follows Manu's injunction that one should not tell the truth unkindly, for 138. Also, Avoiding untruth extends to the point of abstaining from reading fiction, for Hari Harananda. The yogi is always contemplating spiritual truths and does not occupy his or her mind with fictional or worldly trivia, silly fantasy, daydreaming, or imagination. Refrainment from stealing, the third yama, is described as not taking things belonging to others and not even harboring the desire to do so. This latter aspect is important, explains Vaikaspati Misra, since action is initiated in the mind the more one desires something, the more inclined one becomes to acquire it. Thoughts of stealing obviously cannot exist in those free of desire, says Akara. Even if one finds a treasure trove or jewel by chance, it should not be taken since it belongs to someone else, says Hari Harananda. Vyasa defines celibacy as the control of the sexual organs, and this is refined by Vaikaspati. Misra as not seeing, speaking with, embracing, or otherwise interacting with members of the opposite sex as objects of desire. He quotes the Dhaka, Sahid, the eight kinds of sexual indulgences are thinking, talking, and joking about sex, looking at the opposite sex with passion, talking secretly about sex, determining to engage in it, attempting to do so, and actually performing the act, 7.31 to 32. 56 Hari Harananda, ever ready with practical suggestions, says that a frugal diet and moderate sleep are important for celibacy. Plenty of milk and butter may be sattvic for an ordinary person, he says, 57 but not for a yogi. In short, ultimate self, Realization cannot be attained if one is sexually active because this indicates that one is still seeking fulfillment on the sensual level and thus misidentifying with the non-self. Vyasa defines renunciation of possessions as the ability to see the problems caused by the acquisition, preservation, and destruction of things, since these only provoke attachment and injury. There is trouble involved in acquiring things in the first place, says Hari Harananda, trouble again in trying to preserve and upkeep them, and trouble and distress when we inevitably lose them. For such reasons, possession produces saskras, and these activate in the future to cause distress in the form of hankering for objects, or lamentation for having lost them. Hoarding wealth without sharing it is sheer selfishness and points to a complete lack of sympathy for the plight of others, says Hari Harananda. Therefore, 
yogis attempt to give up all objects of enjoyment and take only what is required for their maintenance. No enjoyment can be gained without some level of direct or indirect injury to others, says Vekaspati Misra, reaffirming Vyasa's comments about the centrality of us among the Yamas. The more something is enjoyable, the more one becomes attached to it and strives to repeat the experience often without consideration of the consequences. For others, and thus, correspondingly, more harm is generated to others. Ramnanda Sarasvati notes that the Yamas are situated as the first limb of yoga because they produce their effects without being aided by any other factors. The Nayamas, observances, of the next sutra are dependent on the successful cultivation of the Yamas for their full fruition. In his view, each subsequent limb of yoga thus requires the completion of the previous limbs in order to be pursued fruitfully, but Hari Harananda disagrees with this in his comments to Sutra 2. 34, below. 2. 31 Jiti, Disa, Kala, Samine Vakan Sarva, Vama Maha, Vratam Jiti, Class, Caste, Occupation, Disa, Place, Country of Origin, Kala, Time. Samaya, Circumstance, Anavakan, Unconditioned, Unlimited by, Sarva, Every, Vam, Place on Earth, Maha, Vratam, Great Thou These Yamas are considered the Great Thou. They are not exempted by one's class, place, time, or circumstance. They are universal. In this very important sutra, Patanjali states that the Yamas are absolute and universal for aspiring yogis they cannot be transgressed or exempted under any circumstance such as class, jiti, place, disa, time, kala, or circumstance, samaya. They are non-negotiable for yogis. Patanjali is being conspicuously, and uncharacteristically, emphatic here. Not only are the Yamas of Rada, thou, but a Mahavrata, great thou. This great thou is further qualified as being sarva, bhama, universal. The term universal by definition should make any further qualification redundant, but Patanjali makes a point of additionally naming and eliminating any possible grounds or pleas for exception, these yamas are anavakin, not exempted because of one's class, jiti, place, disa, time, kala, or circumstance, samaya. This is as absolute a statement as can be made. As noted, items placed first on a list carry greater importance than subsequent items, underscoring the importance of the yamas, and, by the same token, as as first of the yamas. At the time of writing this section, there is a discussion in certain quarters of the yoga community in America about the jurisdiction of the yamas in the 21st century West. Whatever direction such discussions may take, and whatever hybrid practices evolve in the West under the rubric of yoga, this sutra makes it very clear that as far as Patanjali is concerned, there are no exceptions to these rules at any time in any place for anyone aspiring to be a yogi as defined by his system. One might imagine that in Patanjali's own circle, there would have been followers or disciples angling for exceptions to one or other of the yamas perhaps arguing that the sacred Vedic law books, dharma, sastras, themselves allowed the Brahma caste, for example, to offer animals in Vedic sacrifices, or the Kshatriya caste to eat meat, or engage in sexuality. He is therefore being as emphatic here as the straightforward and plain use of human language allows. One might add that these yamas are more or less universal among all the liberation, based spiritual traditions of ancient India, and even in the more worldly dharma, sastra traditions, the Vedic law books that concern themselves with more conventional socio-civic duties, for example, Manu X. 63. This is so not only in orthodox Vedic traditions, but in heterodox ones too. The Eightfold Noble Path of Buddhism, requires the observance of five silas, four of which is, satya, brahmacharya, and astya are identical to the first four yamas, and one, abstinence from intoxication, replaces aparigraha, non-coveting. The Jains, too, have five great vows, 
for which they use the same term we find in the Sutra, Mahavrata, and these are identical to Patanjali's Yamas. 58 The Nyaya Sutras acknowledge Yoga as the means to realize the Atman but specify that it entails the following of Yama and Nyama. 4. 2.46 with certain non-mainstream exceptions such as the tantric left, handed practices, 59 these yamas are more or less standard across sectarian traditions, even if not listed in the specific format chosen by Patanjali. The Gita, for example, lists some of the yamas in its description of the divine attributes, Aas and Satya in 16. 2. In its description of the qualities of Sattva, Brahmacharya and Satya in 17. 14 to 15, in its prescriptions for the yogi, Aparigraha in 6. 10, and under qualities emanating from Ka himself, Brahmacharya and Satya in X. 4 to 5. The commentators elaborate on this sutra through a discussion of nonviolence, since it is the most important yama and, as first member of the list, represents the others, however, the following discussion applies to all the yamas. The yama of nonviolence conditioned by caste, jiti, says Vyasa, can be seen in the case of, say, a fisherman who, because of his caste occupation inflicts violence only on fish but nowhere else. Khatriyas, the warrior class, too, are allowed to engage in violence in certain contexts hunting, for example, and, of course, on the battlefield. While this may hold in other circumstances such as these, Nonviolence has no conditions for Patanjali. Jiti literally means family of birth, therefore, being born into a family or caste that eats meat does not constitute an exception to the practice of nonviolence. If, say, a Khatriya wishes to become a yogi as understood by Patanjali, he must abandon violence even if such violence is legitimate for persons of this caste and, indeed, condoned or even required by dharmic prescriptions in the Dharma. Sastra texts, and even if such texts are also considered sacred scripture and authoritative. Authoritative. Manu, for example, who wrote one such law book, states, kings who try to kill one another in battle and fight to their utmost ability, never averting their faces, go to the celestial realms. 7. 89 ff. One can envision that there would have been spiritual seekers in Patanjali's entourage who would have been coming from Khatriya or other Jitis, castes, who might have pointed to such passages in sacred scripture. Here we see a distinction between the requirements of yoga covered in, for example, the Karma, yoga section of the Jita, where Ka exhorts Arjuna to do his civic duty as a Khatriya warrior and fight, to specifically engage in violent warfare, and the ascetic tradition represented by Patanjali. What may be acceptable or even required in a socio-civic context must be renounced in an ascetic yogic one. Indeed, it is with this ascetic alternative in mind that Arjuna initially precisely wishes to renounce violence and take up the ascetic life of mendicancy, too. 5. The Jita. Of course, while accepting the Patanjalian, type path as an acceptable means to attain liberation, e.g. Chapter 6, has, for the most part, a different objective, one directed to socio-civic concerns, and thus construes a different means to attain perfection from within the parameters of the idealized social system, namely karma, yoga, the path of action. While it has long been argued persuasively that the Yoga Sutras are not incompatible with social and civic engagement in the world, E.G. Witcher 1998, 1999, 2005, that is, once avidya, ignorance, is eliminated, one can act in the world from a position of enlightenment 60 Patanjali's position on the role of the Yamas could not be made much clearer. As an example of nonviolence conditioned by place, Disa, Vyasa points to a person who abstains from injury only when in a sacred place but kills animals elsewhere, or, one might add, vice versa for the Vedic ritualist. For Patanjali, nonviolence must be upheld everywhere, irrespective of the ritualistic, gastronomic, or culinary practices of a particular country or place. He defines nonviolence conditioned by time, Kala, 
as when one abstains from violence on certain calendar occasions, for example, during religious observances, such as, in a Catholic context, abstaining from meat at Lent, but not at other times. Yogis must be nonviolent at all times. Nonviolence conditioned by circumstance, Samaya, is exemplified by a person who avoids violence on all occasions except in the context of religious rites. The ancient Vedic Yajna sacrificial rites, which were still the mainstream religious practices of Patanjali's time, involved offering animals into the sacred fire, thus violence in the sacrificial context is prescribed in the ancient Vedic texts. 61 Vyasa also gives the example of soldiers who engage in violence on the battlefield but nowhere else. Although legitimate in other contexts, none of these circumstances applies to yogis. In short, even if one's very dharma, righteous duty, allows for exceptions of this sort, if one wishes to be a yogi, such exceptions no longer apply. One can also mention allowances made in Ayurveda, the traditional Hindu system of medicinal knowledge, for temporarily imbibing certain meat substances to cure very specific medical conditions, which would also come under the category of Samaya. All these exceptions may hold good elsewhere in other contexts but, for the yogi wishing to attain the goals of yoga outlined in this text, say the commentators, this sutra emphatically specifies that any such mitigating factors or conditions no longer apply. Nonviolence and the other yamas must be practiced at all times, in all conditions, everywhere, irrespective of any considerations whatsoever. One can take this or leave it, but Patanjali's intent cannot be expressed much more clearly. The yamas are universal prescriptions there are no exceptions, says Vyasa. Aspiring yogis in the modern Modern context are thus informed in the sutra that renegotiations of the yamas due to the exigencies of modern times and the western landscape are emphatically not recognized by the classical yoga tradition. Hence Patanjali states that the yamas are the great vow. So too, say the commentators, are the nayamas of the next sutra. 62 On a separate note, Gakula, 1995, considers the charge that yoga cannot strictly speaking be considered a moral system, since its goals are not altruistic or focused on the welfare of others, but focused on the liberation of the individual self, it is thus self, centered or egoistic. He concludes, however, that even though yoga's ultimate goal of self, liberation is individualistic, it cannot be attained except through moral means of interacting with others, as indicated by the five yamas, and never obtained through immoral means. It can thus be categorized as a moral system. 2. 32 Sakha, Santo, Tapa, Svadhyayi Svara, Pradni Nayam Sakha, Cleanliness, Santo, Contentment, Tapa, Austerity, Svadhyaya, Study of the Scriptures, Isvara, God, the Lord, Pradni, Devotion to, Nayam, Observances The observances are cleanliness, contentment, austerity, study of scripture, and devotion to God. In contrast with the yamas, which are concerned with how the yogi interacts with others, the nayamas are centered on one's own personal discipline and practice. Vijanabhika rationalizes the categorization of these two sets by pointing out that the former deal with desisting from certain activities, which, being universal, are not qualified by time and place, and the latter with engaging in certain activities, which are qualified by time and place. 63 Vyasa divides the first item on Patanjali's list, cleanliness, Sakha, into external and internal types. External cleanliness pertains to the body and consists, in the pre-modern world of our commentators and rural India today, of cleaning with water and clay, as well as cow dung and cow urine, which are considered pure substances, and of ingesting pure food stuff, which, Vekaspati Misra notes, should be limited in quantity. In terms of ingestion, Harry Harananda reiterates that meat and intoxication cause the mind to be agitated and stimulated they incite rajas and tamas and yoga requires a steady and peaceful mind. Therefore, a yogi never imbibes such substances. He quotes Karika, a traditional authority on Ayurveda, 
whatever is good or most desired in this life or the next is attained by intense concentration of the mind. Alcohol creates a disturbance in the mind. Those blinded by addiction to alcohol. Alcohol lose sight of their best self, interest. Internal cleanliness consists of purifying the mind of all contamination. The commentators speak of jealousy, pride, vanity, hatred, and attachment as examples of mental contamination. Hojaraja states that internal cleanliness is to be accomplished by benevolence exuding a friendly attitude toward all. Contentment, Santo, the second Nyama, manifests as disinterest in accumulating more than one's immediate needs of life. Vekaspati Misra points out that the desire to appropriate the possessions of others has in actuality already been given up in the Yama stage. As the Jita informs us, desire is the real enemy of the embodied soul, since it is never satisfied and burns like fire. 3. 37-39 True happiness comes from contentment with whatever one has, not with thinking that one will be happy when one gets all that one desires. Even if there is some lack, says Akara, one thinks, it is enough. Or, as Harry Harananda puts it, to avoid injury from thorns, one only has to wear one pair of shoes one doesn't need to cover the entire earth with leather. The next Nyama, austerity, tapas, is the ability to tolerate hunger and thirst as well as all the dualities of life, hot and cold, etc. To avoid useless talk, and to perform fasts. Hari Harananda says that yoga requires one to tolerate sufferings of the body, endure hardships, and remain undisturbed by the lack of physical comfort. He cautions, however, that inflicting hardship on the body in the form of voluntary austerity and penance should be undertaken only for the expiation of sins and not otherwise. Study, Svadhyaya, refers to reading sacred scriptures whose subject matter is liberation, 64 and the commentators also include the repetition of oh here harry harananda expands this to include devotional mantras he notes that by practicing this nyama one's desire for worldly objects diminishes and one's taste for spiritual objects increases vyasa here defines the last item on patanjali's list devotion to god isvara pradna which has already received a good deal of attention I. 23 ff, as offering all one's activities to Isvara, the original teacher, I. 26. In resonance with the Jita 2. 47, where this is one of the primary teachings, such offerings must be done without desire for the fruit. Ramnanda Sarasvati quotes two devotional verses to illustrate this, whatever I do, whether with or without desire, whether auspicious or inauspicious, I do it to offer it all to you as directed by you and let all my daily activities, in this life or future lives, whether in deed, thought or word, be dedicated in devotion to Ka. One might draw attention here to numerous verses in the Jita where Ka makes statements such as, whatever you do, whatever you eat, whatever you sacrifice, whatever you give away, whatever austerities you perform, O Arjuna, do it as an offering to me 9 27 Vijanab Hiku despite his own personal Vayavite orientations which are usually evident in his references when discussing the Isvara element displays the admirable Hindu penchant for conceptualizing Isvara as manifest in a myriad of forms by quoting in his Yogasara commentary on the sutra a verse to Shiva the worship puja of Isvara consists of firm devotion to Shiva by means of praise, remembrance, and worship, through one's words, thoughts, body, and actions. 65 Vyasa sees fit to quote another verse in his commentary here, while lying down, sitting, or wandering on the road, one who is focused within and whose net of doubts are weakened, sees the seeds of Sasra weakening. Such a person, always firm in yoga, becomes eternally free and partakes in immortality. 66 He adds that it is from devotion to Isvara that this takes place obstacles are removed and one is able to realize the innermost consciousness. Vekaspati Misra considers devotion to Isvara to be the most important of all the Yamas and Nayamas. As we will see below, 
cultivating the yamas and nayamas produces beneficial results, but it is only from isvara, pratna that the ultimate result of yoga, namely, samadhi, is gained, too. 45. Also, it is important to note again here, that although isvara, pratna was optional as a method of meditation in the first chapter, it is not optional here in the context of the nayamas. As with the requirements of kriya, yoga at the beginning of this chapter, Patanjali is requiring a theistic practice at least at this point in his system. 2. 33 Vitarka, Badhain Pratipaka, Bhavanam Vitarka, Negative Thoughts, Badhain, on the harassing of, Pratipaka, the opposite, Bhavanam, Cultivation. Upon being harassed by negative thoughts, one should cultivate counteracting thoughts. In the next verse, Patanjali defines negative thoughts, Vitarkas, as thoughts countering the Yamas and Nayamas. Thus they are thoughts directed toward violence, untruthfulness, stealing, sexual indulgence, accumulation, uncleanliness, discontentment, luxury, disinterest in scripture, and lack of devotion to Isvara, or, contrarily, devotion to ungodly persons. What is reassuring about this sutra is that Patanjali is essentially stating that when one is harassed by negative thoughts. In other words, negative thoughts will arise in the Siddha. How can they not? Negative thoughts are simply the cropping up of saskras that are eternally recorded in the Siddha of past indulgences or immoral behaviors that all embodied beings have performed at some point just by being subject to the ever changing was. In even the best, tended gardens, weeds inevitably pop up from time to time. As indicated in the Gita, one in whom all desires flow by but who remains undisturbed by them like the ocean into which the rivers flow but which remains undisturbed, attains peace, too. 70. And one who neither begrudges or hankers for the presence or absence of lucidity, activity, or delusion sattva, rajas, and tamas, but who remains as if indifferent, and is not disturbed by the Gwas thinking the Gwas alone are operating, is said to have transcended the Gwas. 14. 22-25. Desires will crop up, Rajas and Tamas will manifest in the Siddha. Hence, Patanjali implies in the Sutra that the task is not to berate oneself upon finding oneself contemplating a negative thought but to deal insightfully with such occurrences. This, according to Patanjali, means considering their consequences, Pratipaka, Bhavna. When one is tormented by perverse thoughts, says Vyasa, such as, I will kill this evildoer, I will lie, I will appropriate this person's wealth, I will commit adultery with that person's wife, I will take control over this other person's possessions, 67 one should cultivate counter thoughts. One should rather think, burning in the fire of this world, I have taken shelter of yoga by committing myself to the welfare of all creatures, after having renounced such perverse thoughts, by again resorting to them, I am behaving like a dog who licks its vomit. 68 This practice of cultivating counter thoughts should be applied to negative thoughts that arise and obstruct the practice of the other limbs of yoga as well, says Vyasa. Actually, this sutra is profound in its implications and provides a means of performing a type of mindfulness meditation for yogis, whereby one consciously adjusts the types of saskras one allows in one siddha. If we consider the Siddha to be essentially a warehouse of Saskras, negative thoughts are merely the activation of some of these previous Saskras lying in storage. Storage, Saskras are never destroyed, we recall, although they can be burnt by yogic practice. In other words, thoughts of violence, dishonesty, etc. arise because of the past practices of such things imprinted on one Siddha. If, when the yogi becomes aware of a perverse thought arising in the Siddha, he or she makes a conscious effort to counter it by invoking a benevolent thought, then a new more sattvic type of saskra is planted in the Siddha warehouse. For example, if an aspiring yogi experiences feelings of dislike for a person, which is a type of his, violence, resulting from ignorance, ignoring the true self of the person, then, upon becoming aware of this feeling, 
the yogi can make the effort to think of the person in a non-violent fashion, perhaps viewing him or her as simply an embodied being victimized by the gwas and karma, etc. And ultimately as a pure purua soul. One might additionally consider how the world might be a better place to live if people could go beyond the superficial impressions and view others as fellow spiritual beings and so forth, a practice that has been referred to as a sort of auto-suggestion 69. The yogi might also ponder the negative consequences of perverse thinking, as outlined in the next sutra. These newly cultivated sattvic thoughts are then recorded in the siddha. The more one practices this type of sattvic thinking in opposition to the rajasic and tamasic thoughts that underpin inclinations toward violence, untruthfulness, and the other qualities opposite to the yamas and niyamas, the more the texture of the siddha is transformed from rajasic and tamasic to sattvic. The more the siddha becomes sattvicized in this way, the less frequently rajasic and tamasic thoughts will surface, and the less effort one will have to make to actually cultivate sattva, artificially, so to speak, sattvic thoughts will start to arise more naturally and spontaneously. As in a garden, the more one makes an effort to uproot weeds, the more the bed will eventually become a receptacle for fragrant flowers, which will then grow and recede of their own accord until there is hardly any room for the weeds to surface. In other words, as sattva is cultivated in this way, the personality of the yogi becomes altered. Weeding of course, can never be abandoned completely, and even the most saintly and accomplished yogi must be ever vigilant for old rajasic and tamasic saskras lying latent in the subconscious depths of the siddha, like the latent seeds of dormant weeds. 2. 34 Vitar Kahisteyakta, Karatanumadita Labha, Kradha, Moha, Purvakamdu, Madhyati, Matra Tukhoinanta, Phala Iti Pratipakabhidvanam Vitark, negative or perverse thoughts, his, violence, daya, etc. Da, performed. Karata, caused to be done, anumadita, allowed, labha, greed, kradha, anger, moha, illusion, pervak, preceded by, ndu, slight, madhya, medium, adi, ma with makron tra with makron, intense, tukha, suffering, Ajanana, ignorance, ananta, never, ending, full, end results, iti, thus, pratipaka, the opposite, bhavanam, cultivation negative thoughts are violence, etc. They may be personally performed, performed on one's behalf by another, or authorized by oneself, they may be triggered by greed, anger, or delusion, and they may be slight, moderate, or extreme in intensity. One should cultivate counteracting thoughts, namely, that the end results of negative thoughts are ongoing suffering and ignorance. The Vitarkas are the thoughts of violence, etc. Contrary to the Yamas and Nayamas outlined in the previous commentary, Patanjali divides them into three categories, those one performs oneself, de, those that one has others perform on one's behalf, Karata, and those that one approves of or authorizes in some way. Anumadita. So, taking, along with the commentators, violence, is, to exemplify the yamas and nayamas, but bearing in mind that this verse applies to all the other yamas and nayamas, killing an animal oneself would come under the first category, purchasing meat that has been killed by someone else is in the second category, and allowing meat consumption to occur in one's sphere of influence, even if one does not consume the meat oneself, would come under the third category. This seems to resonate with Manu, the primary composer of the regulations of Dharma for Hindus in the ancient period, the one who gives permission to eat meat, the one who butchers, the one who slaughters, the one who buys and sells, the one who prepares it, the one who serves it, and the eater they are all killers, v. 51. 70 The Buddha, too, made a similar statement, monks, one possessed of three qualities is put into hell according to his deserts. What three? One who is himself a taker of life, one who encourages another to do the same, and one who approves thereof. 71 Patanjali is being fairly specific here, says Pojaraja, otherwise some dull wit, 
to use his term, may think that since the violence involved in killing is performed by someone else, then the consumer of meat avoids karmic responsibilities. Vijanabhiku includes here even violence condoned in the scriptures, that animals can be killed and eaten under certain conditions, such as in the context of Vedic sacrifice, as does Hari Harananda, who rejects the idea that God has allowed certain types of animal consumption. The emergence of a vegetarian ethic such as that expressed here and in most post-Vedic Hinduism. From the matriarchal culture of ritual slaughter inherent in the ancient Vedic sacrificial texts is an interesting phenomenon that I have examined elsewhere, Bryant 2006. Each of these categories, continues Vyasa, has been subdivided into three degrees of intensity by Patanjali, Ndu, Madhya, Adhimdra, Slight, Moderate, or Extreme. Additionally, they may be provoked in three ways, by greed, Labha, such as a person inflicting violence on animals out of lust for their meat or with an eye to profit from their skins, anger, Kradha, such as a person lashing out violently upon being insulted by someone else, or illusion, Moha, such as a person engaging in violence under the impression that it is his or her duty, or that it is religiously condoned, as in killing animals in a religious context, says Vijanabhiku. Since greed, anger, and delusion can underpin acts done oneself, on one's behalf, or authorized by oneself, and can be experienced in three degrees of intensity, there are twenty, seven divisions of violence noted by Patanjali in the Sutra. Characteristic with the penchant for categorization found in traditional Indic commentaries, Vyasa travels this number, by proposing that the intensity of greed, anger, and delusion can be mildly mild, moderately mild, and extremely mild, mildly moderate, moderately moderate, and extremely moderate, and mildly extreme, moderately extreme, and extremely extreme, probably with the set of subdivisions from I. 21 to 22 in mind. This brings the possibilities up to 80, 1. Actually, continues Vyasa, the possibilities are innumerable since there are other factors qualifying violence such as customary rules, which Vijanabhiku exemplifies as the view that violence can be inflicted on fish but not animals, and other types of options, particular animals can be killed and eaten only on certain days, etc. All these multiple divisions pertain to each of the Yamas and Nayamas. To oppose thoughts of this kind, one should cultivate counter thoughts thoughts on the consequences of such activities, such as Patanjali's suggestion that violence leads to unlimited suffering and ignorance. The perpetrator of violence, says Vyasa, first overpowers the strength of the victim, by binding it, says Vekaspati Misra, then inflicts violence on it by weapons, and then takes its life. As a result of this, the perpetrator's own life forces are weakened in this life, and in the next life, he or she takes birth in hell, 72 or in a lower species of life, where, says Vijanabhiku, the very same violence previously inflicted on other creatures is experienced by the perpetrator. Hence, Patanjali's statement that inflicting violence eventually brings suffering to the agent. Ultimately, all creatures are parts of Isvara, God, explains Vijanabhiku, like suns to the father and sparks to the fire. Therefore, violence against others is violence against God. He quotes the Gita, envious people act hatefully towards Mika. In their own and in others' bodies. I continually hurl such cruel hateful people, the lowest of mankind, into Sasric existence, into only the impure wombs of demons, 16. 19. Violent people live every moment as though dead, Vyasa continues. Indeed, they may even crave death but are forced to live on because, by the law of karma, some of the fixed fruits of their activities have to be experienced in this life, for example, says Vijanabhiku, a person may be tormented by a horrible prolonged disease as a karmic consequence. Even if a violent person experiences happiness in this life, notes Vyasa, this is due to good karmic reaction accrued from simultaneously performing pious activities along with the impious ones in a past life. 
These good reactions balance out some of the bad karmic reaction from the violence being committed in the present, just as seeds of grain are sown along with seeds of grass, says Vijanabhiku, but the negative karma will manifest in some other fashion. Fashion a person may experience a short lifespan, for example, or the seeds of violence being sown in this life may lie dormant until the next life. By the law of action and reaction, violence always eventually breeds suffering for the perpetrator, who has to personally experience the same violence he or she inflicted on other beings. It also breeds ignorance, the second consequence of perverse thoughts mentioned here by Patanjali. Vaikaspati Misra states in this regard that violence is the result of tamas, and perpetuating violence increases the tamas, ignorance, of the siddha. Real knowledge is thus further covered over. One becomes less likely to ponder the reactions of one's violence or other harmful activities, and thus is less aware of the karmic consequences one is creating for oneself. Reflecting on the undesirable consequences of negative thoughts in some of these ways, one should not allow the mind to contemplate them. Cultivating the opposite types of thoughts is the means to remove such perverse notions. Although the commentators have focused on violence for this discussion, since it has been presented as the basis of all the yamas and niyamas, Vyasa makes it clear that the discussion here can be applied to thoughts that are contrary to all the other yamas and niyamas in turn. Also it seems important enough to reiterate, and aspiring yogis might be relieved to do so, that Patanjali specified in the previous sutra when one is afflicted by negative thoughts, not if. Negative thoughts are nothing other than old saskras, present in great abundance in the siddhas of all embodied beings. They will surface until the yogi is very advanced and has burnt up the productive power of all latent seeds by practice. The task, then, is not to become despondent upon their periodic and inevitable emergence but to counter them as outlined here. When negative thoughts are eliminated, powers accrue to the yogi. These are indicative of the yogi has success in this regard and are the subject of the next sutras. 2. 35 is, Pratahim Tad, Sunit Hauvera, Taiga is, Nonviolence, Pratahim, upon the establishment, Tad, is, sunit how, in the presence, vera, enmity, taiga, giving up of in the presence of one who is established in nonviolence, enmity is abandoned. In the following section, 2. 35 to 45, Patanjali selects some of the boons that accrue to the yogi by following, pratahim, 73 each of the ten yamas and niyamas. Vyasa states that all living beings give up their enmity in the presence of one who is established in nonviolence. In other words, a saint exudes qualities that rub off on his or her associates. That is to say, the yogi's sattvic mind can pervade out and sattvicize the minds of other beings in the vicinity, countering their rajas and tamas, and stimulating their own sattvic potentials. The commentators state that even natural enemies such as cat and mouse or mongoose and snake give up their enmity in the presence of the yogi who has fully renounced all thoughts of violence, due to being influenced by the yogi's state of mind. One is reminded here of an episode in the hagiography of the 15th century mystic Chatanya Mahaprabhu, who caused the deer and tigers in the forest to dance and embrace each other upon hearing him recite the holy names of Ka. 74 such accounts surface in numerous traditions, one might mention Saint Francis of Assisi, and his taming of the wild wolf, and the Moroccan Sufi woman Saint, Rubia, who lived on a hill surrounded by wild animals 75, and the furious elephant Nailagiri who became quiet in the presence of the Buddha. 76. According to Hari Harananda, perverse thoughts such as violence can take many subtle forms in the mind that are not always readily visible, these have to be exposed and rooted out through the force of meditation. Specifically, the fifth limb of yoga, fixing the mind, dra, is essential for perfecting the yamas and niyamas such as nonviolence. In this, Hari Harananda adds nuance to the view of some commentators who say that each limb of yoga has to be practiced first, before the next one can be undertaken. Of course, all the limbs must eventually be perfected, but Dra deepens the ability to practice the earlier limbs, in his view, and, 
indeed, it is through Dra and its successive limbs of Dhyana, pure concentration, and Samadhi, meditative absorption, that the Yamas and Nayamas become faultless, and the Asanas, postures, perfected. 2. 36 Satya, Pratihi Kriya, Vilasrayavam Satya, Truth, Pratihim, upon the establishment of Kriya, activity, work, Vala, fruits, Esrayavam, the nature of being a support or basis when one is established in truthfulness, one ensures the fruition of actions. The commentators understand the sutra as indicating that the words of a truthful person invariably bear fruit, Vala. Their utterances are infallible. If the yogi who has perfected this yama says to someone, be virtuous, says Vyasa, then the person will be virtuous. Vijanabhika qualifies this somewhat by stating that the yogi will utter the words be virtuous only to one who is fit to be so. He adds that the yogi need merely think something pertaining to someone and it will come about. Hari Harananda also qualifies Vyasa's comment by noting that yogis do not make whimsical or fruitless pronouncements beyond the reach of their power, that is, their will. He understands the ability mentioned in the sutra, like the one discussed in the previous sutra, to be brought about by willpower. Truthfulness, satya, is cultivated by willpower the determination never to tell a lie. This power of simple truth can sway the mind of the listener to act in accordance with the yogi's words. When one meets a saintly person who is situated in truthfulness, one senses that, unlike all other people with whom one comes into contact, this person has no desire or inclination to exploit or manipulate others for personal interest. Such a person is qualified to act as a guru, and one can accordingly entrust oneself to his or her guidance. Vaikaspati Misra has a slightly different take on this sutra. For him, the actions, kriya, referred to by Patanjali here refer to pious and impious activities, and their respective fruition means future births that are correspondingly desirable or undesirable. By ensuring the fruition of actions, kriya, vilasrayava, he understands Patanjali as saying that the yogi who has perfected the yama of truthfulness has control over actions and, consequently, the fruits they bear in future births. 2. 37 Astya, Pratihi Sarva, Ritnopaste Hanam Astya, Refrainment from Stealing, Pratihim, Upon the Establishment of, Sarva, All, Ratna, Jewels, Yupast Hanam, Approach, come into the presence of when one is established in refrainment from stealing, all jewels manifest. Vyasa simply says, in regard to one following the Yama of non-stealing, Astya, that jewels, Ratna, approach the yogi from all directions. Vaikaspati Misra's only comment is, this verse is easy, and Vijanabhiku and the other commentators offer nothing to explain the sutra. Hari Harananda, however, offers some useful interpretations that save us from having to imagine jewels suddenly flying through the air toward the accomplished yogi. Established in non-stealing, a glow of detachment and indifference radiates from the face of the yogi. People are inspired by this to feel that this person is trustworthy and has absolute integrity, they thus feel honored to bestow their most valued things on such a yogi, confident that they will be put to the best possible selfless use. Hari Harananda takes Ratna, jewel, to mean the best of every class of things. Thus, the pure, hearted yogi attracts the best of human beings and is offered the best of material things by those he or she inspires. R. S. Bhattacharya, 1985, 153, takes the jewels to refer to noble, hearted people as well as useful things. Thus, noble, hearted people approach the yogi who is firmly fixed in honesty with a view of acquiring divine wisdom, likewise, useful things are offered to the yogi in service. 2. 38 Brahmacharya, Pratahim Vairya, Lba Brahmacharya, Celibacy, Pratahim, on the establishment of, Vairya, Potency, Power, Lba, the gain upon the establishment of celibacy, power is attained. Vyasa states that when celibacy, Brahmacharya, 
is established, a yogi perfects his or her qualifications without obstruction. Established in celibacy, the yogi becomes capable of imparting knowledge to disciples. Otherwise, the words of wisdom of an incontinent person, says Hari Harananda, do not go deep into the mind of a disciple. Vijanabhiku understands the power, Vairya, Patanjali is referring to as the power of knowledge and action. Hojaraja speaks of it as vigor in one's bodily organs and mind. Other commentators connect the power mentioned in the sutra with the eight mystic powers that will be discussed in the next chapter. Hari Harananda, for example, says that celibacy prevents the loss of vitality, and thus virya, potency, is retained. This accumulates until it culminates in physical and spiritual power, including the mystic powers described below. In Ayurvedic physiology, Ajas is a subtle vital energy or substance that forms the essence of all the seven bodily tissues, Dada 77, and, along with Pra, controls the life functions. It is the essential ingredient in vigor and potency, both physical and spiritual. When semen is dissipated by excessive orgasmic activity, the body and immune immune system are deprived of this vital resource and the individual becomes susceptible to psychosomatic ailments. Brahmacharya, celibacy, then, enhances potency. Hari Harananda adds that celibacy involves abstaining even from thoughts of objects of desire through a firm control of one's mind, as well as through a controlled diet and sleep, it cannot be attained if one indulges in too much sleep or food intake. There are many stories of yogis attaining tremendous powers by the practice of celibacy, some of which will be touched upon on the next chapter. Indeed, one does not even have to be a yogi to accrue the benefits of celibacy, in the ADI, Parva section of the Mahabharata, the great Bhaidma, grandfather to the opposing PA with Makrandadeva and Kaurava cousins, became the most powerful and invincible warrior of his time partly due to his unbreakable vow of celibacy. Once, his father, the great King Suntanu, fell in love with the beautiful daughter of the chief of the fishermen. Upon approaching the girl's father for her hand in marriage, the chief of the fisher community indicated that he would grant the king his daughter's hand only if the son born of their union would succeed Suntanu on the royal throne. The king declined, since Bhaidma was his eldest son from a prior union with the goddess of the river Gag and thus the rightful heir, but he languished with his unfulfilled desire. Upon learning of the reason for his father's moroseness, the noble Bhaidma approached the fisher chief to ask him for his daughter's hand for his father, assuring him that he would allow the offspring of this union to supersede him to the throne. Still the chief of the fishing community demurred, stating that while he had no doubts about the inviolability of Bhaidma's words, he did entertain doubts as to whether Bhaidma's own progeny might one day agitate for the throne. Bhaidma then uttered a vow in the presence of all that he would, from that day on, adopt a life of Brahmacharya. Since his vow was unbreakable once made, even though it resulted in all kinds of intrigues when the two sons born of Santanu's marriage to the second wife both died without leaving an heir to the throne, Bhaidma was awarded the boon of dying at will. This boon was perhaps more technically the result of his following the Yama of Satya, truthfulness, since his word was inviolable, but his adoption of a life of Brahmacharya enhanced his already semi, divine powers. 2. 39 Aparigraha, Sthariya Janma, Kothan Tat, Sambhata Aparigraha, Refrainment from Covetousness, Sthariya, On the Steadfastness, Constancy, Janma, Birth, Kothan Tat, The Haunas, Sambhata, Knowledge, when refrainment from covetousness becomes firmly established, knowledge of the wise and wherefores of births manifests. On perfecting the yama of refrainment from covetousness, aparigraha, the knowledge of the circumstances of the yogi's present birth as well as of previous and future births, janma, kathan ta, is automatically revealed if the yogi desires it, according to Vyasa and the commentators. The yogi knows exactly who he or she was in a previous birth, specifies Bhojaraja, what sort of a person in what sort of circumstance. The connection between cause and effect is hereby revealed, 
says Ramnanda Sarasvati every type of birth, after all, whether human, animal, or celestial, is the fruit of previous activities, karma. The yogi is able to perceive precisely how the present birth is the consequence of previous activities, and how present activities will fructify in the form of a specific future birth. Again, the ability to access previous birth surfaces frequently in Indic texts, the Buddha, for example, by marshalling all the techniques of Dhyana, meditation on the night of his ultimate enlightenment, was able to bring to mind all his previous births, according to his hagiography. He remembered thousands of past lives, as if reliving them again, that I had been such and such a person at that time, and then, passing out of that life I had come to this other life, Buddha, Karita 14. 2-3. Bhojaraja elaborates here that refrainment from covetousness involves not coveting the means of enjoyment, and this includes the body, which is the mechanism of enjoyment. In normal life, due to desiring enjoyment, one's consciousness is directed outward and thus the type of knowledge mentioned in the sutra does not reveal itself. In other words, when awareness is not dissipated externally, it can be channeled internally into one siddha where all the imprints of past life experiences are recorded. By accessing these saskras, the yogi can gain awareness of the past lives in which they were recorded. Along the same lines, Hari Harananda states that delusion stemming from attachment to one's body obstructs knowledge of the past and future. When this is given up and one becomes conscious of the body as separate from the self, the body becomes a superfluous burden, and the power of clairvoyance, which means awareness that is not limited to the bodily organs of sight, etc., is developed. One might imagine the Siddha as a lake, and Saskras as pebbles within it. When a lake is crystal clear, one can see the pebbles clearly and easily retrieve them. When the lake is choppy or murky, one cannot. Similarly, when the sattva potential of the Siddha is maximized, it is clear, and therefore its Saskras, including those of previous lives, can be more easily extracted. When Rajas and Tamas are prevalent, in contrast, it becomes choppy and murky, and even recent memories are difficult to bring to recollection. R. S. Bhattacharya, 1985, 149-51, takes the Janma, Kathanta, Sambhadha of the Sutra to refer not to knowledge of previous births arising in the mind of the yogi free of coveting, but to thoughts arising in the minds of people associated with the yogi. The Janma, Kathanta in his reading refers to people's curiosity about the circumstances of the yogi's personal life. Specifically, impressed by the yogi's attitude of aparigraha, refrainment, people wonder about the birth of the yogi. In other words, they wonder in awe how an embodied being can be free from attachment, etc. The next few sutras are directed toward the side effects generated by the perfection of the Nyamas. 2. 40 Sakatsvka, Jagupsa Parayar Asasarga Sakat, from cleanliness, Svka, one's body, Jagupsa, distaste, para, with others, Asasarga, cessation of union, intercourse, or contact by cleanliness, one develops distaste for one's body and the cessation of contact with others. Perceiving the defects of the body, says Vyasa, one develops a distaste for it, Jagupsa, keeps it clean, and becomes self, controlled. The yogi reflects on the nature of his or her own body svka, seeing that it is never clean no matter how much it is washed with water and cleansing agents, indeed, the yogi desires to free Purua from the body. So how, questions Vyasa, could a yogi engage in intimate contact with the bodies of others, which might be all the more unclean? By the practice of cleanliness, Sakha, say the commentators, attraction to the opposite sex evaporates, as it does by the contemplation of the realities of the body. Cleansing the body essentially consists of wiping away sweat, urine, feces, mucus, and other discharges and substances which, in and of themselves, are not erotic but obnoxious. By meditating on the realities of the act of cleanliness, the yogi ceases to see the body as an erotic object. 
one is thus freed from the oppressive and ultimately disappointing pressures of erotic illusion and fantasy. There is the story of a king who, becoming thirsty after hunting in the forest, approaches a secluded hermitage in quest of water. He is greeted by a beautiful but spiritually enlightened young maiden who had been raised as a fully enlightened yogini by the resident sage of the hermitage. Overcome by desire for this beautiful maiden, the king propositions her. Deciding to enlighten the lusty king as to the realities of bodily. Bodily lust, the maiden requests him to return within a month, at which time she will allow him to taste the nectar of her beauty. During this period, however, the maiden takes laxatives and purges, and collects all the resulting vomit, urine, feces, and other physical discharges in earthen pots. When the king returns after the stipulated period, he is greeted by the maiden, now haggard and wasted and a shadow of her previous self. Upon asking her what had become of her beauty, she presents the king with the earthen pots with their rancid contents and indicates that therein lay the juices of her beauty. She thus acts as the guru of the king, enlightening him as to the reality of the body, the foolishness of bodily identification, and the superficiality of bodily attraction. 78 Along these lines, in this sutra, Patanjali indicates that when one meditates on the act of cleanliness, and the reality of the body and its temporary and skin, deep beauty, one develops a distaste for it, jagupsa, and consequently, for sensual contact with other bodies, parayar asasarga. After all, one has to work rather hard to present the body as an erotic and enticing object cleaning it carefully, decorating it with makeup, cosmetics, and fashionable clothing, pruning its out of hair, and overpowering its natural odors with artificial scents. Even then, the body can at any moment emit embarrassing odors or noises beyond one's control if one is not attentive, and a romantic moment can be quickly dispelled if one unexpectedly is impelled to vomit or is suddenly overcome by an irrepressible onset of diarrhea or gas. The yogi sees through the hype and illusoriness of bodily embellishment and uses the act of cleanliness to meditate on the reality of the physical body, which, from this perspective, can be seen as a bag of obnoxious substances. Seeing bodily reality in this way, the yogi ceases to see other bodies as erotic objects and thus ceases fantasizing about sexually enjoying or exploiting others. This, of course, does not preclude appreciating the body in non-erotic ways as a vehicle of enlightenment or a temple of God, for example. Harry Harananda notes that animals express their love for other animals by licking their bodies. Indeed, just as animals are aroused by sniffing each other's excrement, which most humans would consider to be unclean or distasteful, humans, in turn, engage in other types of expressions of sensual bodily intimacy, which, in parallel fashion, are seen by the yogi as unclean and distasteful. The yogi conveys love for other beings through compassion, friendliness, spiritual exchanges, and other expressions that rise above physical sensuality. As an aside, there are non-mainstream radical ascetics who use bodily discharges as part of their practice. Some extreme Saivite groups, for example, smear themselves with taboo substances and meditate in cremation grounds as catalysts in transcending bodily identification. While this is by no means a normative or common Hindu practice, it can nonetheless constitute a serious yogic practice if performed with the right intent. After all, ash from human corpses and bodily fluids are ultimately simply transformation of prakti. The Jita, 6. 8 informs us that the enlightened sage sees everything whether it be a stone, pebble, or gold as the same. From an ultimate, metaphysical perspective, what is the difference between feces and fragrant or precious substances if they are all ultimately merely transformations of the quasa prakti? By means of such extreme practices, the practitioner strives to rise above the dualities of tastefulness and distastefulness on the sensual level. Additionally, Upon being subject to the scorn and abuse that such practices might engender from society, the practitioner is called upon to transcend the dualities of honor and dishonor on a psychological level. In the Bhagavata Pura, v. 9.1-11, afraid of getting attached to anyone or anything his 
attachment to a deer in a past life having caused him to undergo two further births, see the commentary to 3. 6 for the story, the erstwhile King Bharata behaved like a dullard, dressed in a filthy rag, and never washed his body, such that people abused him. Yet, immersed internally in full awareness of his real self as Purua despite his ragged appearance without, he was like a jewel covered by dust. His father too, the great King Arabha, an incarnation of Vayu himself, when the time came to renounce his kingdom, wandered around naked with disheveled hair like a madman, such that ignorant people passed urine on him, spat at him, and threw stones and feces at him, Bhagavadavi. 5.1 FF Again, such practices are by no means mainstream in yoga traditions, but they are certainly theologically defensible and, by virtue of their practitioners' willingness to abandon the most basic civilized notions of personal behavior in their intense quest for truth, deserve respect. When undertaken with the true goals of yoga in mind. Patanjali is not recommending such practices here on the contrary, he is promoting cleanliness as an indispensable limb of yoga but a similar type of meditation on the realities of the constituents of the body underpins the intent of the sutra. 2. 41 Sattva, Sati, Samanajya Ekagrayendriya, Jayadma, Darsana, Yagatvani Ca Sattva, the Gwa of Sattva, Sati, Purification, Samanajya, Cheerfulness, Ekagraya, 1, Pointedness, Indriya, Senses, Jaya, Control, Atma, Self, Darsana, Direct Seeing, Yagatvani, Qualification, Fitness, Ca, and upon the purification of the mind, one attains cheerfulness, one. Pointedness, sense control, and fitness to perceive the self. Sattva, as used in the context of the sutra, is another term for buddhai, intelligence, since the constitution of buddhai is primarily sattva. 79 The previous sutra dealt with the boons accruing from cleanliness of the body, Patanjali here deals with the results ensuing from purification, or cleanliness of the mind. Vyasa reads a chronological sequence to the qualities listed by Patanjali, from cleanliness, sati, the mind is purified, that is, becomes sattvic, from purification of the mind, cheerfulness, samanasya, a by, product of sattva, arises, from this, one, pointedness, ekagraya, ensues, and this, in turn, leads to sense control, Indriya, Jaya, when the mind is pure and focused, the senses are automatically under control. Sense control causes Rajas and Tamas to be subjugated and enhances the sattva of the mind, and a sattvic mind qualifies the yogi to become eligible to perceive. Perceive the Atman. All this is attained by cleanliness of the mind, says Vyasa. Harry Harananda says that cheerfulness or mental bliss arises when the mind has given up the obstacles of arrogance, pride, and attachment, and becomes aloof toward the body and material possessions. This feeling of happiness, which is inherent in the sattvic potential of the mind, is necessary for mental one, pointedness, he adds, which in turn is a prerequisite for realizing the Atman. 2. 42 Santat Anuttamasuka Lba Santat, from contentment, Anuttama, the highest, Sukha, happiness, Lba, the attainment. From contentment, the highest happiness is attained. Vyasa limits his comments here to quoting a verse, whatever happiness there may be in enjoyment in this world, and whatever greater happiness there may be in the celestial world, they do not amount to one sixteenth of the happiness attained from the cessation of desire. Adi Vijanabhika reminds us of a similar verse from the Taittiriya Upanishad, 2. 8, quoted fully in 2. 5 of this commentary, that the bliss of Brahman is countless times greater than that experienced by the most fortunate of embodied beings. He explains that when hankering is removed, the siddha becomes content, santo, as indicated in the sutra. Sattva thus becomes undisturbed, and the highest happiness, anuttama, Sukha, which is inherent in the nature of sattva, manifests spontaneously. At other times, the innate happiness of sattva is covered by tamas. 
This sattvic happiness does not depend on external objects, which are vulnerable and fleeting, but is inherent in the mind when it is tranquil and contented. 2. 43 Kendriya, Siddhara Sudhi, K Tapasakaya, the body, Indriya, senses, Siddhai, perfection, Asudhi, impurities, Kate, from the removal, Tapasa, from austerity from austerity, on account of the removal of impurities, the perfection of the senses and body manifests. As early as the Vedic Brahma texts, Tapas has been recognized as a vital form of preparatory ascetic purification to be undertaken by the sponsor of the Vedic sacrifice, the Yajamana, 81 and has remained a fundamental ingredient of Indic soteriological traditions. As austerity is practiced, says Vyasa, the impure covering of dirt, Asudi, Tamas and Rajas, is destroyed, and as this happens, the Sthis, or mystical powers of the body such as clairvoyance and clairaudience, manifest. The commentators thus take Patanjali's perfection of the body, Kendriya, Sthi, as a reference to the various mystical powers, Sthis, that are the by, product of yoga, which will be discussed in the next chapter. Hojaraja and Ramnanda Sarasvati take Patanjali's impurities here to refer to the Klesas. Hari Harananda understands them to be subjection to the limitations of the body, such as hunger, thirst, and other cravings. According to him, by the performance of austerities in the form of sleep control, abstention from food, retention of the vital energies of the body, celibacy, etc. And by the practice of Prima and Asana, one can overcome these limitations by sheer willpower, which is how he approaches all the Yamas and Nayamas, and this leads to the manifestation of the Sthis. Hari Harananda notes that Jainanis, those following the path of Jainana, Yoga, the Yoga of Knowledge, generally do not develop these Sthis because they cultivate renunciation and discrimination rather than austerity. Sthis, then, are specifically the by, product of tapas, in this view. Jainanis are unlikely to be interested in such attainments anyway, continues Hari Harananda, and neither are the yogis, who use them, if at all, only to further their spiritual goals. 2. 44 Svadhyayad Ia, Devata, Samprayaga Svadhyayad, Study of Scripture, Ia, Desired, Preferred, Devata, with the deity, Samprayaga, Connection. From study of scripture, a connection with one's deity of choice is established. Svadhyaya literally means self, study, but it more commonly refers to the study of sacred texts, in a sense the two meanings overlap, since sacred texts typically teach about the self. In the earlier Vedic period it involved recitation of the sacred Vedic texts by the student until they were memorized, thus providing the basis for the later tradition to construe the term as referring to both study of sacred texts and the recitation of sacred syllables. From study, according to Vyasa and the other commentators, the ice sages, celestial beings, and perfected siddhas become visible, and they assist in the yogi's work. The commentators take this at face value, whatever deity the yogi wishes to see, says Vijanabhiku, will appear. Vyasa has indicated that Svadhyaya includes the recitation of O, in 2. 32, and the commentators reiterate here that the recitation of mantras is one of the ingredients of Svadhyaya. Hari Harananda makes the interesting observation that ordinarily, during Japa, the repetition of mantras, thought does not remain fixed on the meaning of the mantra, and the practitioner typically repeats the mantra aimlessly while the mind is roaming here and there. When Svadhyaya is established, however, the mantra and the deity it represents remain uninterruptedly present in the mind. He states that deities invoked with such ardor and faith are sure to appear before their devotees. This does not occur when the mind is sometimes fixed on the mantra and sometimes distracted. Scriptures typically present themselves as encapsulating the life and teachings of divine or saintly beings. Patanjali can be read as saying here that by reading scriptures, one becomes spontaneously attracted to a particular Ia, Devata, a manifestation of divinity. 
Ia means desired or preferred, and Devata means deity, so Ia, Devata refers to one's deity of choice. By reading the various scriptures of the world, the aspiring yogi at some point starts to become partial to or especially attracted to a particular spiritual persona whether Ka, Vayu, Shiva, Devi, Jesus Christ, Buddha, or any other divine figure, or empowered sage. Such a personage becomes one's Ia, Devata, and one worships God in the form of or through this Devata. This involves the japa recitation of the mantra associated with this form of divinity. In my view, it is most unlikely that Patanjali is using the term Devata in its older sense of the minor Vedic deities who are propitiated in Vedic rituals and later derivative Hindu pajas for worldly boons. The notion of Virajya has already been thoroughly established as a prerequisite for Yoga, I. 12 to 16, and the yogi has long been disinterested in the enticements of Vedic ritualism, Anus Ravika, in I. 15. Indeed, we will see in Vyasa's commentary in 3. 51 that the minor gods try to distract the yogi from the path and lure him or her back to worldly sensory stimulation. In the hymns of the Vedic period, the gods, Devata, are solicited most especially for victory over enemies, for cows, and for offspring. In the Puric period they are propitiated for sthi powers and other material boons. 82 Their jurisdiction is exclusively over the workings of Prakti and, consequently, to be avoided by yogis as bad association, so to speak. Given Patanjali's goals, Ia, Devata here must therefore refer to the forms of Isvara, as it is used in theistic texts, 83 rather than some minor deity. This correlation of forms of Isvara with Ia, Devata is further supported by Vyasa and the commentators considering Svadhyaya to include the recitation of O. Patanjali has indicated that O is Isvara manifest as sound, and that meditation on Isvara is to be performed by Japa of O. Moreover, one must recite this Tad, Artha, Bhavanam, bearing its meaning in mind. Therefore, if by Svadhyaya one encounters one's Ia, Devata as indicated in the Sutra, and Svadhyaya entails reciting O while meditating on Isvara, then the Ia, Devata one. Encounters from this process must be none other than a form of Isvara and not some minor Vedic deity. Therefore, Patanjali must be using Devata to refer to the established forms of Isvara evidenced on the mainstream theistic landscape of his time and not the secondary gods, with a lowercase g, whose jurisdiction is the bestowing of temporary material boons in which the yogi has long lost interest. Therefore, by reciting O and studying the Isvara scriptures, one becomes attracted to a particular form of Isvara. One might suppose that this process of study in some cases involves the reactivation of Saskras from past lives, when one might have already developed a devotional relationship with a particular form of divinity, which becomes spontaneously reactivated in a subsequent life upon encountering this form in some scriptural source. 84 One might also note here that typically in Hinduism, theistic meditation on Isvara is performed by reciting the name of one's Ia, Devata. In the form of Japa, usually appending this name onto the generic and long, revered syllable O. As noted, the mantras most likely to be encountered in Hindu meditative practices are Onamo Enrayaya, the most commonly recited Vayu, based mantra, O Nama Sivaya, the Saivite equivalent, Onamo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, the more classical Ka mantra, and the by now ubiquitous Ka mantra popularized by A. C. Bhaktivedan Taswami, Herka, Herka, Kika, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. An interesting question, broached earlier, can again be raised at this point as to whether anything can be inferred about the identification of Patanjali's own Ia, Devada. My own view is that he must necessarily have been either a Vayava follower of Vyuslashka or a Saivite follower of Shiva. Of the six schools of traditional thought that stem from this period, Vornyaya, Vayika, Yoga, and Vedanta were theistic. Anska had both theistic and non-theistic variants. 
85 While the sectarian affiliations of the reputed founders of these theistic schools cannot be determined with certainty, the overall later Nyavaika tradition seems to have been Saivite, 86 and the Vedanta, including Akara, Vayava. Patanjali, like the authors of the root texts of other theistic schools, is not specific about the persona of Isvara, God. Certainly, if we accept the consensus dating Patanjali in the 2nd and 3rd centuries, Vayava and Saivathisms had long emerged as prominent, if not dominant, religious expressions around the subcontinent. It is thus probable that Patanjali was associated with one of these traditions. The Vayavite Jita, according to most dating estimates, and the theistic Upanishads such as the Saivites Vetasvatara certainly had been around for several centuries, and the massive Puric corpus, which focused primarily on these two streams of devotional religiosity stemming from Vayu and Shiva, was well on its way to its final state of compilation sometime during the Gupta period within which Patanjali penned his treatise. From a close study of the sutras, it is clear that Patanjali is not just a yogi but also an astute intellectual, 87 and thus it seems impossible that he was unfamiliar with such sources. As we see from this sutra, he not only stipulates the practice of Svadhyaya but also states that from such study one connects with one's IA, Devata, deity of preference. This suggests that Patanjali was not only well versed scripturally, but was himself oriented toward a specific deity of preference. As has been seen throughout the text, Patanjali accepts and promotes the notion of Isvara, God, a category which, given the context of the time, had long been associated with Vayu and Shiva by their respective devotees, and, later, with Isvari, by the goddess tradition 288. A Patanjali with Vayava or Saivite orientations is thus not a frivolous consideration. It is curious that none of the seminal texts of the four theistic philosophical schools identifies Isvara, but it is unlikely that this indicates a time before sectarian quibbling became more pronounced, a time when theological dogma was less important, given the fairly pronounced sectarian tone of the Jita and, indeed, but to a lesser extent, of the Svetasvatara Upaniad, and of course of the Puric corpus that was under compilation by Patanjali's time. Of course, nothing prevents Patanjali from favoring an inclusivism, which has long been noted as a characteristic of Hinduism, and identifying Isvara with both Vayu and Shiva in different contexts. Vaikaspati Misra, for example, who identified Vayu as Isvara above, nonetheless speaks of Shiva as Isvara elsewhere in the sutras, with his trademark Catholicism. 89 Hindu devotion is typically not exclusivistic, it tends toward inclusivism of a hierarchical nature, and inclusivistic sectarianism, Vayava texts, while accepting the multiplicity of other divine manifestations. Subordinate them under Vayu, as do the Saiva texts under Shiva, for example, Jeet 9. 23. Despite what sometimes appears to be the partisan nature of the texts associated with one or the other of these two supreme beings, both accept and indeed extol the transcendent and absolute nature of the other, and of the goddess, Devi, too, merely affirming that the other deity is to be considered a derivative or secondary manifestation of their respective deity, or, in the case of Devi, the Sakti, or power of the male divinity. Monotheism, if the term is to be applied to the Puric tradition, needs to be understood in the context of a supreme being, whether understood as Vayu, Shiva, or Devi, who can manifest himself or herself into other supreme beings, albeit all of them secondary to the original Godhead. 90 Thus, in the Bhagavata, Vayu, in addition to being able to manifest unlimited other identical Vayu forms, e.g. x. 13 manifests himself in the form of Shiva for a specific function to perform. The task of destruction at the end of the universe, x. 71.8, and into the goddess Devi or Sakti for another function to manifest the actual stuff of the universe, Prakti, and perform other tasks such as cover the souls with illusion, in her capacity of Maya. In any event, such hierarchical inclusivism aside, we find in this sutra the notion of Ia, Devata. Since, 
As we have seen, Svadhyaya is mandatory as an ingredient of Kriya, Yoga and as a Nyama, we can conclude that all yogis are expected to have an IA, Devata for the practice of Yoga. By his own prescription, therefore, Patanjali would have been oriented toward one specific deity. Given his focus on Isvara, rather than some lesser Deva 91, throughout the sutras, and the fact that the category of Isvara on the religious landscape of his time was associated with Shiva and Vayu, it seems reasonable to conclude that Patanjali would in all likelihood have been either a Saivite or Vayavite. I have considered this issue in whatever depth is allowed by the available data elsewhere, comparing Patanjali's scanty theology of Isvara with those of the Vayavajita and Saivites Vetasvatara, Bryant 2005. I will merely note here that, despite the paucity of explicit data, the strongest evidence for a Vayava orientation is the fact that Patanjali himself is considered an incarnation of Vayu's carrier, EA. Had he been a Saivite, it is a priori likely that the tradition stemming from him would have preserved a mythology of him being an incarnation of, say, Nandi, Shiva's bull, or some other associate. Moreover, as I have already noted, the yoga tradition has associated the primary commentator, Vyasa, circa 4th to 5th century, with the renowned sage Vyasa of Mahabharata and Puric lore, grandfather of the Pavas who is embedded in Vayava contexts and considered a manifestation of Enraya slash Vayu, 92 which is relevant here for the same reasons, all the more so if those who posit. The Vyasa, via to have been written by Patanjali himself are correct, and Vyasa implicitly refers to Ka as Isvara in, for example, his commentary on I. 25. In terms of the sutras themselves, if we accept the commentarial correlation of Patanjali's Kriya, Yoga with the Jita's devotionalized karma, Yoga, a practice most associated with the latter text which seems reasonable given the common etymology of the two terms from the root K, as well as the action, based context of Kriya, Yoga then one might have further grounds to suggest a closer connection with the Jita. Other than this, Patanjali's notion of Isvara teaching the ancients raises obvious associations with Ka's assertion in the Jita that he comes every age to re-establish Dharma, etc. and is read this way by the commentarial tradition. Finally, one might also note that the Jita's usages of the three types of Puruas, 15, 16 to 18, match those of Patanjali's reference to Isvara as a special Purua in I. 23.93 in short, while any and all of these assertions can be easily problematized, we can at least say that Patanjali's IA, Deva must have been either Vayu or Shiva, with the scanty evidence perhaps favoring the former. One cannot make too much of this, since, while the Vayu related evidence might have a few snippets more with which to recommend itself, the question is theoretical and one cannot ignore the fact that Patanjali chose not to proclaim who his IA, Devata is. I prefer to imagine a Patanjali who, while himself a devotee, was too sophisticated a thinker to overly sectarianize the theistic element in the sutras and thereby risk alienating the sensitivities of those dedicated to other conceptualizations of Isvara, or, for that matter, of those devoid of any devotional inclinations. Indeed, while clearly guiding his readers toward a theistic orientation, and while he must have been either a Vayava or a Saivite given the Isvara, Veda options of the 2nd and 3rd centuries, Patanjali is not actually even insistent in his promotion of the theistic element itself in the higher practices of yoga. He has thus articulated a more universal, or at least universally adaptable practice pertaining to plumbing the most profound depths of human consciousness that can be appropriated by any number of sacred as well as secular belief systems. That his teachings continue to be so appropriated even in the 20, First, Century West might point to his foresight in this regard. 2. 45 Samadhi, Siddhar Isvara, Praden Samadhi, Ultimate Meditative State, Siddhai, Perfection, Isvara, The Lord, God, Praden, From Submission, Surrender from Submission to God comes the Perfection of Samadhi. Of all the boons noted in the sutras as accruing, from the observance of the Yamas and Nayamas, it is only from Isvara, Pradna that Samadhi, 
the actual and absolute goal of yoga, is attained. The other boons are all attainments still bound by the realm of prakti, mystic powers, knowledge of past births, jewels, etc. These other boons are thus temporary blessings, only the boon accruing from the Nyama of Isvara, Pradna is ultimate. This fact in and of itself is significant. In the first sutra of this chapter, Patanjali includes Isvara, Pradna as a mandatory ingredient of Kriya, Yoga, and we have seen, too. 32, that Isvara, Pradna is a mandatory part of Aga, Yoga as well. Although Patanjali does not mandate that the yogi mediate on Isvara in the Samadhi section of the first chapter, he certainly dedicates far more attention to Isvara than any other meditative alternative. Those six sutras when coupled with the sutra suggest that Patanjali is promoting Isvara as the best object of meditation. Granted, he allows that one can meditate on any object and attain the goal of yoga, I. 39 but only one object out of the universe of possible objects can, in addition to serving as a meditational prop for the mind, intervene and bypass or at least accelerate the normal process of practice by bestowing samadhi on the practitioner as an act of grace. That object is isvara. One thus gets two for the price of one, so to speak. What advantage, from this perspective, could there be an opting for some other object of meditation that cannot speed up or even bypass the process? It is hard to avoid the fact that Patanjali is promoting a theistic system, albeit in a discreet and non-dogmatic fashion, and the comment aerial tradition certainly reads it in this way. This notion of receiving a vision of the self as an act of grace is an ancient one. The Kahapaniyad states, by the grace of the Creator one perceives the glory of the Atman, too. 20, as does the Svetasvatara, 3. 20. Patanjali here indicates that Samadhi is perfected in the yogi who has dedicated everything to God. By such dedication, the yogi knows all he or she desires to know, says Vyasa, whether it pertains to other places, other times, or other bodies. Here, Vyasa refers to the Sthi of Omniscience, discussed in Sutra 3. 50 ff. This sutra does not mean that the other seven limbs of yoga are redundant, say the commentators. Whether one's object of concentration is isvara or some other object, one still needs to practice the limbs of yoga, samadhi, as full and in distract meditation, presupposes all the other limbs. According to Vaikaspati Misra and Ramnanda Sarasvati, the other seven limbs of yoga help the yogi to develop the requisite mental state that allows complete devotion to isvara. Vijanabhika puts it differently, one can say either that by mastering the other limbs of yoga by the grace of Isvara, Samadhi is born, or that the other limbs bring about Samadhi by the grace of Isvara. But do not have this power themselves. Either way, surrender to Isvara is indispensable for the perfection of yoga, and the yogi cultivates all the limbs of yoga but directs them toward God. Dhojaraja states that success is attained in this way because Isvara, being pleased, removes the klesa obstacles and awakens samadhi, and other commentators also speak of grace in this connection. Ramnanda Sarasvati states that devotion to Isvara has a different object from yoga, the goal of which is realization of Purua, and thus can be considered to be an additional limb of yoga. In this he resonates with certain theistic traditions of the Puras, as exemplified in the most important of the Puras, the Bhagavata, realization of one's personal purua is a secondary or even irrelevant by product of devotion to god isvara the bhakta or devotee wishes to bathe in the bliss of gods the supreme purua s presence rather than in that of his or her own personal purua and is often disinterested in self realization the attainment attainment of god realization is the goal the gopis of the bhagavata for example had no interest in self, knowledge, they were simply crazed in their love for Ka. 94. Patanjali's focus in his text, of course, is the individual Purua, but the Isvara element remains a tantalizing presence throughout, and he does not inform us what he considers to be the relationship between the liberated Puruas and the special Purua that is Isvara in the liberated state. 
While one cannot randomly project sectarian puric theologies onto the sutras, one also cannot extricate and immunize Patanjali's Isvara from the theological landscape of his time. We have stressed that, in our view, this greater theistic landscape cannot be avoided in considering how Patanjali envisioned Isvara. Ramnanda Sarasvati reiterates that, although one has an option, devotion to Isvara hastens the attainment of Samadhi, if one lacks faith in Isvara, Samadhi remains remote, but if one's yoga is permeated with the nectar of devotion, it is very near. One is reminded of Arjuna's question to Ka in the Gita, 12. 1. As to which yogis are the best those who are devotees and continually worship Ka as a personal object of devotion, or those who follow the Akara, Avyakta path, literally, the imperishable unmanifest path, which most commentators take to be a reference to the quest for the individual soul. 95 Ka states that although the followers of the latter path also attain him, such a path is difficult and troublesome. 12. 3 to 5, but one who is always absorbed in him personally with faith and devotion is considered the best yogi. 12. 2. As in the Gita, then, in the sutras, Patanjali subtly indicates that devotion to Isvara is the best and safest path for the aspiring yogi dedicated to self, realization. One might note here that although Patanjali is promoting a theistic practice, he does not develop a psychology or methodology of bhakti, devotion, other than the recitation of O with awareness of its meaning, I. 28. This is not his project in this text. The task he has set before him in these sutras is a discussion of yoga in the context of the psychology of mind and the attainment of purua. Different traditions in the Hindu intellectual tradition focus on specific areas of knowledge but often presuppose awareness of traditions that are dedicated to other systems of knowledge. While there may be disagreement on specific points and different traditions may focus on different aspects of human existence, these systems generally accept the overall validity of other bodies of orthodox knowledge where they do not contradict their own. Thus, in Patanjali's time, a variety of traditions specifically occupying themselves with theologies and methods of Isvara, Pradna, more commonly known as Bhakti, would have long gained wide currency. Such traditions were already developing sophisticated and extensive theologies, so one might infer that Patanjali, albeit a theist himself, given the growing availability of Isvara, centered theology saw rather a need to articulate and contribute a more specific and focused psychology and theology of Purua in its relationship with Siddha. In other words, one might speculate that he did not focus extensively on Isvara because this dimension of metaphysical inquiry had already been amply covered elsewhere and thus Patanjali could direct his disciples to already existing systems in that particular area of spirituality. The streams of devotion most dominantly associated with Isvara on the widest scale across the Indian subcontinent over the last two and a half millennia have been the Vayu and Shiva centered traditions. The Vayu traditions have been the most dominant in literary circles, expressed on a popular level in the two great epics of India, the Mahabharata and the Ramayaya, on a more theological but still popular level, in the Puras, especially the Bhagavata and Vayu Puras and on a more philosophical level in the Bhagavad Gita and in the most influential stream of Indian philosophy, the Vedanta commentarial tradition. But Bhakti to other aspects of divinity, especially the great Lord Shiva, as well as various forms of goddess worship, pervades all the Puras. The Shiva traditions, although not producing epics of the stature of the Ramayaya and the Mahabharata, in which Shiva is an important presence, or influencing philosophical discourse to the extent that the Vayava Vedanta tradition did, although the Nyayavaika tradition was to become primarily Saivite, nonetheless developed sophisticated Shiva, centered theologies and primary puras such as the Shiva and Skanda. The goddess, too, has a pura, the Devi Bhagavata, although this is likely a later compilation, and goddess, based Sakta traditions, while less mainstream in terms of the high or classical literary traditions, have also contributed much to the intellectual and theological history of the Indic traditions, especially on a more grassroots level. In any event, 
to all intents and purposes, popular Hinduism all. Across India today is essentially an expression of the various forms and traditions of Isvara, Pradna as expressed in these Bhakti traditions. And it is from this vast array of Isvara, Pradna practices that Samadhi, as variously conceived in the myriad and multifaceted sectarian traditions of India, is most commonly attained. We must note before considering the next limb of yoga that Patanjali dedicated 16 sutras to the Yamas and Nayamas, to 30 to 45, almost a tenth of the entire text, far more than he dedicates to any limb other than Samadhi. They are a crucial and indispensable prerequisite of yoga. 2. 46 styra, suksam asanam styra, steady, suksam, comfortable, asanam, posture posture should be steady and comfortable. Patanjali now moves on to the third limb of yoga. The term asana is rarely found in the ancient mystical Upanishadic texts, except on occasion in the sense of a seat, Bhadrayaka 4. 2.1, 6. 2.4, Taitariyai. 11.3, although it is used in the Jita, 6. 11, in the same sense Styra, steady in which it is found here. Although the entirety of yoga is typically understood and presented as asana, physical posture, in the popular representations of the term in the West, it is actually only the third limb of yoga, not an end or goal unto itself, although see the comments on Guruji Iyengar in I. 39. Indeed, given that he has just dedicated 16 sutras to the Yamas and Nayamas, Patanjali has relatively little to say about asana, leaving us with only three sutras on the topic consisting of a total of eight words, or, put differently, considerably less than 1% of the text occupies itself with asana. However, we should not conclude that this limb is irrelevant. That Patanjali does not give more. Detail about specific asanas does not mean he considers them unimportant practices for yogis. One could also suppose that other extant texts concerned themselves with the specifics of asanas. While asana, specific texts may not have survived from that time, we cannot conclude they did not exist. Vyasa, below, knew of 12 asanas in the 5th century, more, in fact, since he adds etc. After his list. The 14th century Haha Yaga Pratapika, I. 17 FF, speaks of 84 asanas taught by Shiva, from which it outlines 15. The Gorika, Saitaka states that there are as many asanas as species 8,400,000 and that Shiva chose 84 of these, from which Siddhasana and Padmasana are the best 97, as do the 17th century Garasahit, 2. 2, and the Shiva. Sahid, 3. 100. Madhav in the 16th century mentions 10, 465 ff. Although these texts are much later, we can assume they drew to some extent on much older sources, as the Mahabharata already makes passing reference to more than one kind of asana. 12. 142, 13. 304. Thus, one has grounds to suppose that Patanjali saw no need to elaborate on the details of asana since information was available in texts or traditions specifically dedicated to that purpose. Vijanabhiku takes this position, an elaboration of asana is not undertaken here, because our subject matter is Raja, Yoga, 98 and a full and detailed treatment of the subject is to be found in works on Haha, Yoga. 99 essentially, Posture is a limb of the actual goal of yoga to the extent that it allows the meditator to sit firmly, styra, and comfortably, sukha, for meditation. Indeed, as noted, asana literally means seat, jita 6. 11. Obviously one cannot fix one's attention onto something if one is sleeping or running about, one must sit, and sit without fidgeting or discomfort. In other words, asana's relevance and function for the classical yoga tradition are to train the body so that it does not disturb or distract the mind of the yogi in any way when sitting in meditation. Akara quotes a verse stating that mastery of postures does not produce the goals of yoga, 
only getting rid of the klesa obstacles to yoga, and samadhi, undeviated absorption on the object of meditation, can produce the goals of yoga. 100. The point is that yogic postures are useful only to the extent to which they facilitate fixing the mind completely. Along similar lines, Vijanabhika quotes the Garuapura, which states that asanas, or yogic postures, are not the goal of yoga, meditative practice is, the prescriptions pertaining to postures and asanas are not the producers of yoga, all such rules so elaborately described generate delay, Sasukala attained perfection by dint of the force of memory and abhyasa, practice. 101 The Sasukala story is recounted in the Bhagavadapura, x. 74. Sasukala, Ka's enemy, attained perfection simply by fixing his mind without deviation on Ka. His enmity against Ka was so strong that he could think of nothing but Ka. The story illustrates the benefits of undeviated meditation on Isvara, even, as in this case, if performed with hatred, that is, with the Klesa of Dva, indeed, all Klesas, in full force. This motif adds a new dimension by indicating that although the Klesas must under any other circumstances be eliminated for Samadhi to become possible, 2, 2, 13, etc. By the grace and power of intense Isvara, Pradna, however performed, and in this context and this context only, one can attain perfection even despite the klesas. This is not in disharmony with what we can glean from Patanjali's own frugal statements, I. 24, 2, 2, 42. Posture, says Vekaspati Misra, is the way one sits. Vyasa names 11 asanas as examples, and these are elaborated upon somewhat by the commentators. Vijanabhika quotes Vasiha as Vyasa's source for the first four asanas, 102 and the yoga, Pradipa for the remainder. Yoga teachers might be interested in considering which asanas were thought to be the most noteworthy for inclusion. Inclusion by Vyasa in his commentary more than a millennium and a half ago. The names of the poses along with their descriptions as given by the commentators are as follows, Akara notes that only the highlights of these poses have been described. 1. Padmasana, the lotus pose. As Vekaspati Misra notes, this pose is well, known to all and needs no description, the lotus asana is worshipped by all, according to sage Vasiha, says Vyasa. It involves placing the two feet on the two opposite thighs and holding the two toes with the opposite two hands. Akara adds that the hips, chest, and neck should be straight, the eyes fixed on the tip of the nose, as indicated in Jita 6. 13. Lips closed like a casket, teeth not grinding against each other, chin a fist's distance away from the chest, the tip of the tongue resting inside the front teeth, and hands joined and resting. Resting on the two heels, see Jita 6. 11 FF for similar prescriptions. These basic principles apply to all the poses listed below, he adds. Once there is no effort involved in holding this posture, he says, it can be called the lotus posture. 2. Virasana, the hero pose. One foot is placed on the opposite thigh, and the other is placed on the ground below the other thigh. 3. Bhadrasana, the gracious pose. The ankles are placed below the scrotum, on the sides of the frenum of the prepuce, and the solace are held tight by both hands interlocked. 4. Svastikasana, 103 The auspicious pose. One sits with the left foot placed between the right thigh and knee, inclined slightly downward, and the right foot placed in the same fashion between the left thigh and knee. The toes should not be seen, says Akara, and the testicles should rest comfortably between the feet. 5. Dasana, the staff pose. This involves sitting down and stretching the thighs and legs along the ground, like a staff, with the solace and toes touching each other closely. 6. Sopes Rea, the support pose. This asana involves sitting down with a yoga, paka. There is difference of opinion as to what a yoga, paka is, 104 but, as the name indicates, it was some sort of a prop, Akara takes it to be a table or chair, 
but paka can also refer to a piece of cloth or a board. Whatever is involved, followers of the Iyengar method may care to note that the sutra indicates that props for asanas have been used for centuries and are, in this sense, authentic. 7. Pariyaka, the bed pose. This asana involves lying down with the arms stretched by one's knees. This is also known as the corpse pose, savasana, says Hari Harananda. 8. Kranka, Niyadana, the curlew pose. This asana and the next two are to be performed by watching the seating postures of curlews and the other animals referred to. 105. 9. Hasti, Niyadana, the elephant pose. 10. Yura, Niyadana, the camel pose. 11. Sama, Sastna, the level pose. Vaikaspati Misra says that the heels and the tips of the feet are pressed together with the knees bent somewhat. Vijanabhiku says that one places the hands over the thighs and remains with body, head, and neck straight up. Vaikaspati Misra states that the steadiness Patanjali refers to in the sutra means that these postures must be held without motion. No fidgeting. Fidgeting. Says Vijanabhiku. Comfortable means that the poses must not cause trouble to the yogi. Also, all of them require that the chest, neck, and head in other words, the spine be kept straight, says Hari Harananda. Akara notes that Vyasa had written etc. After listing these poses, indicating that there can be variations prescribed by the guru. On this note, Akara states that yoga should be performed in a quiet and pure place, after performing obeisances to the Supreme Isvara, the sages, and one's own guru. One might include in this discussion the reference to asana in the Vedanta Sutra tradition, for 1.7-10, where sitting firmly is a prerequisite for fixing the mind. Moving around requires effort and is distracting, says the great theistic Vedanta commentator Ramanuj, and lying down provokes sleep, therefore, one should sit on some support without any bodily effort. 2. 47 Prayatna, Sethilyananda, Samapatibhyam Prayatna, Effort, Sethilya, Relaxation, Ananta, The Infinite, The Cosmic Serpent Ea who holds the worlds upon his heads, Samapatibhyam, The Power of Thought Transformation, Engrossment, Absorption of the mind such posture should be attained by the relaxation of effort and by absorption in the infinite. Asana becomes perfect when all effort or strain, prayatna, ceases and the body no longer trembles, says Vyasa, and when the siddha is absorbed in the infinite, ananta. Hari Harananda elaborates that the practice of asana involves a level of pain at first. After a time, this disappears by complete relaxation, Sethilya, into the pose, and by meditating. Meditating on infinite space so that eventually the body feels non-existent, like infinite space. The essential idea is that by the practice of asana, the body should be so relaxed that the yogi ceases to be conscious of it at all, and the mind can thus be directed toward meditation without any bodily distraction or disturbance. Since one of the names of Ea, the thousand, headed cosmic serpent upon whom Vaya reclines, and who holds the universe on his hoods, is Ananta. Some commentators also consider the Ananta from Patanjali Sutra here to be a possible reference to him, since, as Ramnanda Sarasvati notes, he holds the worlds very firmly. In other words, Asana should be held as firmly and comfortably as Ea holds the worlds on his hoods. As is well, known, Patanjali himself is considered to be an incarnation of Ea. According to tradition, Ea, desiring to teach yoga on earth, fell, pat, from the celestial realms into the palm, Anjali, of a virtuous woman named Goik. The 11th century commentary of Pojaraja contains the following invocation to Patanjali in the form of Ea, which is still recited at the beginning of Asana classes in the Iyengar tradition, I bow with folded hands to Patanjali, best of sages, who removed the impurities of the mind through yoga, the impurities of speech through grammar and the impurities of the body through medicine. To he whose upper body has a human form, who holds a conch and kakra, disc weapon, 
who is white and has a thousand heads, to that Putanjali, I offer obeisances. 162. 48 Tato Dvandvnabhida Tata, consequently, from this, Dvandva, by the opposites, Anabhida, not afflicted. From this, one is not afflicted by the dualities of the opposites. By mastering posture, says Vyasa, one is not overcome, Anabhida, by dualities, Dvandva, such as hot and cold. This language of transcending such dualities is very common in the Vedanta tradition, for example, Jita 6, 7, 12, 18. Hot and cold, and all shades in between, represent the spectrum of sensations of the body, so this sutra indicates that once asana is mastered, one loses all awareness of the sensations of the body. The mind can now be focused elsewhere in meditation without being distracted by the body. Hari Harananda notes that upon mastering asana, a state of calmness is experienced in the body, which allows for a detachment from the body's sensations such as hunger and thirst. In other words, the purpose and perfection of asana indicated by Patanjali are when one loses all awareness of the body and, consequently, its sensations. It is a preliminary ingredient in a far larger undertaking. 2. 49 Tasman Sathisvesa, Prasvesayar Gadi, Vikata Prima Tasman, that, Sathi, is attained, Sveza, inhalation, Pravseo, exhalation, Gadi, movement, Vikata, regulation, Prima, breath control when that asana is accomplished, Prima, breath control, follows. This consists of the regulation of the incoming and outgoing breaths. Patanjali now moves on to the next limb of yoga, prima, but we can note that the first phrase of the sutra, Tasman Sathi, known in Sanskrit. Grammar as a Sathi Subdhamai, a locative absolute construction, indicates that this is to be undertaken while asana is being perfected. Similar phrases introduce several of the other limbs as well, too. 53. 3. 2. One can thus argue for a consecutive interdependence among the limbs, each one presupposing that the yogi is cultivating and mastering the previous ones. Most important for aspiring yogis, one cannot bypass the yamas and niyamas and expect to be able to fix the mind in the serious and prolonged meditation of the subsequent limbs of yoga. Without cultivating the yamas and niyamas, the mind will not manifest the requisite state of sattva, without which there can be no meditation and thus no serious practice of yoga as defined by Patanjali. It is Rajas and Tamas that provoke the Vaitarkas, the thoughts, tendencies, or urges contrary to the Yamas and Nayamas, too. 33-34, and it should be very clear by now that the higher goals of yoga cannot be attained while Rajas and Tamas are prominent in the Siddha. Prima as breath control is an ancient practice that can be found in the old Brahma texts. 107 Vyasa explains that the Svesa from the Sutra is the intake of air from the outside, and Prasvesa, the exhalation of air from the stomach. He defines Prima to be the suspension, or absence, of both in other words, the suspension of breath. Since Patanjali speaks of a type of suspension of breath as the fourth type of Prima in two, 51. The commentators clarify that here Patanjali is implicitly referring to three other types of breath suspension, Gaudi, Vikata, Rikeka, where breath is suspended after Prasvesa, Exhalation, Purika, where breath is suspended after Svesa, Inhalation, and Kumhaka, the simultaneous suspension of both. Hari Harananda, however, while accepting the definition given by the other commentators, states importantly that there is more to the prima referred to here than just these techniques, some of which receive attention in the 14th century yoga manual Haha Yaga Pradapika. He stresses that concentration on one's object of meditation has to accompany the practice of prima. One must clear the mind of vitas in conjunction with suspending the breath, not just devote oneself to suspending the breath alone. In his commentary to the next sutra, he notes that yogic prima in turn, done properly, reciprocally helps to arrest the vitas of the mind and make it one, 
disappointed. Thus this practice can lead the mind toward samadhi. In any case, without such arresting of the mind, prima is not yoga but merely a physical feat. He further notes that in samadhi, the breath becomes imperceptible, or even wholly suspended. 2. 50 Bahaya Bhyantara, Stamha, Vititasa, Kala, Sakibhai Parado Durga, Skma Bahaya, external, Abhyantara, internal, Stamha, restrained, suppressed, Viti, movements, Disa, place, Kala, time, Sakibhai, and number, Parada, is manifest, Durga, long, Skma, subtle Prima manifests as external, internal, and restrained movements of breath. These are drawn out and subtle in accordance to place, time, and number. Vyasa defines the external, Bahaya, of this sutra as when there is no flow of breath after exhalation, internal, Abhyantara, when there is no flow of breath after inhalation, and restrained, Stamha, as the simultaneous cessation of both, the commentators specify that these refer to the Rikeka, Purika, and Kumhaka suppress ions mentioned. In the last sutra 108, Viti means anything that turns or revolves and thus can apply to breathing, as in this verse, or anything else, in addition to the churnings of thought. The movement, Viti, of breath ceases, he notes, just as water shrinks and contracts from all sides and evaporates when it is sprinkled on a heated stone. The breath remains within the body when it ceases to move in and out, adds Vekaspati Misra, like motionless water filling a jar, says Ramnanda Sarasvati. Moving on to the second part of the sutra, all these different types of breath restraint are regulated by place, disa, that is, the surface area that is reached by the breath, says Vyasa. He understands time as the seconds of duration of these cessations of the flow of breath, and number as how many sequences of inhalations and exhalations are restrained, and whether they are mild, middling, or intense in nature. The commentators elaborate on this schema. In terms of place, the surface area covered by breath is either external or internal. The external range of breath here is measured by a piece of cotton or blade of grass placed at a certain distance a hand span or 12 fingers from the nose to see at what point it is moved by the breath. The internal range of breath is measured from the solace of the feet to the head and can be sensed like the touch of an ant. In Kumhaka, breath ceases in both these spheres. This external and internal range or surface area of breath constitutes Patanjali's place. Time, Kala, refers to the differing durations of each individual exhalation, inhalation, and retention, and is calculated by Ka a unit that is taken here to correspond to a quarter of the time it takes to blink the eye, but C3. 52 for a more metaphysical definition. Prima is regulated by the number of cause involved in the restraint, etc. of the breath. Number, Seiki, is the number of repetitions, or rounds of each cycle of inhalations, exhalations, and retentions at one sitting. Time differs from number, says Vijanabhiku. Vijanabhiku, in terms of the method used in calculation. Number is determined by Matra. Vijanabhiku quotes a verse 109 that states that a Matra corresponds to a single clap of the hands, the opening and closing of the eyes once, or the utterance of a phoneme, for example, the GA sound in yoga, Vekaspati Misra takes a matra to correspond to the time it takes to rub one's kneecap three times and then snap one's fingers. According to Vijanabhiku, 12 matras are the unit used for prima. He prescribes drawing in the breath through the right nostril for the duration of 16 matras and, once the lungs are full, holding the breath for 60, 4 matras, after which one exhales for the duration of 30, 2 matras. This is to be accompanied by meditation on the O Mantra. Vekaspati Misra and Vijanabhiku also differ in their understanding of Vyasa's mild, middling, and intense demarcations. Vekaspati Misra takes mild to be 30, 6 matras, middling twice that, and intense thrice that amount, whereas Vijanabhiku quotes the Gurumpura, 9. 32, in which mild is understood as 12 matras, 
middling as 20, 4, and intense as 30, 6. 110 Harry Harananda recommends the internal chanting of mantras as an alternative to the various mantra techniques, using the repetition of a certain number of mantras to demarcate the duration of the period separating inhalation, exhalation, and suppression. The common denominator of all this is simply that some consistent system of time demarcation is used in Prima. By practice, says Vyasa, these restrictions of breath become drawn out, Durga, and subtle, Skma. In other words, say the commentators, one can increase the duration of these intervals of breath restraint so that they become more and more prolonged and imperceptible in terms of the movement of air, such that with practice cotton wool does not move. Even when placed at the tip of the nose, specifies Harry Harananda. 2. 51 Bahai Abhyantara, Vaikep Katerdha Bahaya, External, Abhyantara, Internal, Vyaya, The Sphere, Range, Kep, surpassing, Katerdha, the fourth the fourth type of Prima surpasses the limits of the external and the internal. The fourth, Katerdha, type of Prima, says Vyasa, refers to the total suppression of breath and so, like the Kumhaka mentioned previously, also involves the cessation of inhalation and exhalation. Vijanabhika calls it Kevala, Kumhaka, pure Kumhaka. In his Yogasara commentary, he quotes the Bihan, Naradiyapura as referring to it as Sunyaka. The commentators are not overly helpful in clarifying the precise difference between the third type of Prima, Kumhaka, and the fourth type, Katerdha. As is the case with so much in the sutras, it is clear that these are techniques to be experienced by practice rather than understood intellectually. Vyasa states that the third type of suppression is brought about by a single effort, whereas the fourth takes place gradually with prolonged effort. Apparently, Kumhaka is performed independently of the suppression of breath in Rikeka and Purika that utilizes the system of measurements, it is thus limited in duration. Katerdha, in contrast, says Vijanabhiku, involves an extension of the cessation of breath that occurs after exhalation and inhalation in Rikeka and Purika that is not determined by time and number, and the adept of the stage of Prima can maintain the suppression of breath at will, even for a month or a year. It thus surpasses the other three stages of Prima. One might also suppose that in this state the body is being maintained by the internal circulation of Pra rather than any external flow of breath. Accounts of suspending the functions of conventional breathing are fairly standard throughout the ascetic yoga traditions of ancient India. In the Pali Buddhist tradition, Mahihima Nikaya. 121 FF, the Buddha describes his own experiences with stopping breathing, and similar accounts are found in Jain literature, Uttaraj Haya 29. 111 The Jita also speaks of Pirpna Samau, the equalizing of the incoming and outgoing breath, v. 27, and the practice plays a central role in the Haha Yaga Pratapika, 2. 74 FF, 4. 112. Harry Harananda mentions that he knew of someone who could remain buried alive for 10 or 12 days as a result of his ability to restrain the breath, and even the great philosopher of modern times, Dasgupta, claimed to have witnessed a yogi remaining in a state of suspended animation for 9 days, without intake of food or drink, and devoid even of heartbeat. 112 accounts were also documented during the colonial period, such as the case of one Haridas, buried alive in 1837 in the Lahore court of Raja Ranjit Singh, with extensive precautions taken against fraud, all of which was documented by Sir Claude Martin Wade. 113 The yoga tradition has long been full of accounts of yogis who have suspended their breath and been buried alive for prolonged periods and then exhumed alive, at which time they reactivated the normal breathing processes. Indeed, related phenomena have recently attracted some degree of scientific attention. 114. In its beginning stages, Vijanabhika continues, this fourth type of prima is accompanied by sweating, in higher stages, by shivering, and in advanced stages, by a feeling of flooding. When mastered, 
one attains mystic powers such as the ability to fly and go anywhere at will. He cites Dhruva from the Bhagavata Pura, 4. 8 FF, as an example of someone who had mastered this type of prima. The Dhruva story is well, known in the Puric tradition, offended by his co-mother, who would not allow him to climb on the lap of his father the king, Dhruva is advised by his own mother, the neglected co wife of the king, to practice austerities and worship the supreme lord Vayu if he wished to sit on the lap of his father. Dhruva is given further directions by the sage Narada for specifically how to meditate and worship lord Vayu, and these include the practice of Rikeka, Purika, and Kumhaka, and meditation on the mantra Onamo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Although he was only five years old, the boy betook himself to the forest and practiced severe austerities with a view to attaining an audience with the Supreme Lord Vayu. Worshipping the Lord as he had been directed, the lad ate some simple fruits only every third day for the entire first month of his austerities, for the second month, he abstained from all food except for withered grass and leaves consumed every sixth day, for the third, he renounced all food and subsisted only on water drunk every ten days, for the fourth, his only form of sustenance was air inhaled every 14 days, and then every 15 days. It is here that Dhruva's story becomes relevant to the sutra, suppressing the breath for 14 or 15 days at a time indicates a mastery of the fourth type of prima noted by Patanjali in the sutra. For the fifth month Dhruva refrained from all activities whatsoever, including breathing, thereby extending this particular process of prima to its maximum extent, stood on one leg in some variant of the Akapata, VK Sana tree pose, and focused exclusively on Lord Vayu. Because of his complete absorption on the Lord of the Universe, Dhruva's personal condition emanated out and pervaded the whole universe, such that all other beings also became deprived of breath. We can note here, given that the topic is the subject of much of the next chapter, that this process by which the yogi absorbs the qualities of the object of meditation by absolute unflinching absorption on that object is called Sayama. In this case, since Vayu is the supreme soul pervading the entire universe, Dhruva became as if one with Vayu due to his complete mental absorption on Vayu, and thus his own personal condition of Kevala, Kumhaka pervaded the entire universe. Although the boy's worship and meditation were tinged with personal motive, Vayu was nonetheless moved by the incredible determination of the lad, appeared before him, purified his heart of all desires, klesas, and bestowed various boons upon him. A further example from the Bhagavata Pura of a yogi who had mastered the techniques of Prima is described in 2. 54 below. 2. 52 Tata Chait Prakvaram Tata, then, Chait, is weakened, Prakasa, illumination, Viram, covering then, the covering of the illumination of knowledge is weakened. Prakasa, illumination, as we know from 2. 18, is a sinwoin for sattva. The covering of illumination, Prakasa, Vara, says Vyasa, is ultimately karma, and this is destroyed by the practice of Prima. He quotes a verse that speaks of karma as the net of great illusion that covers sattva and impels one to commit immoral deeds. Karma, we recall, consists of actions that are all recorded in the Siddha as Saskras and that fructify at the appropriate time, conditioning one to act in certain ways. Karma is in this sense synonymous with the storehouse of Saskras, which trigger the behavioral patterns and preconditioned attitudes, perspectives, or responses to the world such as the immoral deeds mentioned by Vyasa. It is a net of illusion because, like a net with many knots, when the myriad saskras fructify, they channel awareness away from its source and absorb it in conditioned patterns of behavior, the sattva of the mind forgets the true nature of the purua and becomes enamored by the objects of the senses, says Vijanabhiku. Pursuing these sense objects, additional karma is produced, and thus the mind remains further trapped and entangled in this net of action and reaction. In this sense it is karma that sustains ignorance, the covering of knowledge, the misconception that the body and senses are the true self. Although, technically, only knowledge can ultimately destroy ignorance, says Hari Harananda, 
it is only when the covering of karma is weakened that knowledge can shine forth unobstructed. This covering of karma is weakened, says Vyasa, by the practice of Prima. He quotes a verse that there is no greater ascetic practice than Prima, from which defects are purified and the light of knowledge shines forth. 115 Manu, 2, states that from the performance of Prima accompanied by the repetition of the O Mantra, the impurities of the sensory powers are burnt away, just as the defiling impurities of metal ore are burnt away in the heat of the furnace. 6. 72. 2. 53 Dre Su Ca Yakuta Manasa Dre Su, for concentration, Ca, and Yakuta, fitness, competency, Manasa, mind. Additionally, the mind becomes fit for concentration. Manasa is used here rather than Siddha, as it is the specific aspect of Siddha that interacts with the senses, and awareness must now make a transition from the sensory involvements of Brahma and the next limb, Pratyahara, to the transsensory stage of Dra, concentration. 116 Dra is the sixth limb of Yoga, which will be discussed shortly. The commentators assume the sutra to be self explanatory and have little to add. For the mind to be able to fix on an object of concentration, it must be sattvic, that is, rajas and tamas must be minimized. Bhojaraja says that once freed from its defects by these breathing techniques, the mind can remain fixed wherever it is directed, in other words, the correct performance of prima prepares the mind for concentration, the preliminary stage of meditation and ultimate samadhi. Again. The sequential nature of the limbs is indicated in the sutra. But one more step is required before the mind can successfully undertake the practice of dra, concentration, this is the fifth limb of the next verse. 2. 54 Svavi Isam Prayaj Satasya Svara Panikara Evendra Pratirasva, their own, Vyaya, sense objects, Asam Prayaj, not coming into contact with, Satasya, of the mind, Svarapa, nature, anukra, imitation, resemblance, eva, as if, indram, of the senses, pratira, withdrawal pratyahara, withdrawal from sense objects, occurs when the senses do not come into contact with their respective sense objects. It corresponds, as it were, to the nature of the mind when it is withdrawn from the sense objects. Patanjali now introduces the fifth limb of yoga. Pratyahara, which is when the senses do not come into contact with the sense objects, Svavyaya, Asamprayaga, a practice referred to as early as the Shandogya Upanishad, 8. 15. This is accomplished through the mind, when the mind is under control, says Vyasa, the senses are automatically under control, they do not need to be restrained separately. He illustrates this with a metaphor that is drawn from the Prasna Upanishad, 2. 4. Just as when the queen bee flies up, all the other bees fly up along with her, and when the queen bee settles down, all the other bees automatically settle down, so the mind and senses are directly interconnected. When the mind is fixed on the object of meditation, says Vijanabhiku, the senses cease their functioning without any separate endeavor, but when the mind is not controlled, it becomes inclined to follow the senses and is dragged out into the sensual world. He quotes Manu here, if even one of the senses slips away, a person's knowledge slips away through that sense, like water from a water bag. 2. 99. The Jita, 2, states, the senses are so impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a learned person who is endeavoring to control them. 2. 60. 2. 55 Tata Parama Vyadendram Tata, from this, Parama, highest, Vajyata, control, Indram, of the senses from this comes the highest control of the senses. In order to illustrate Patanjali's qualification here of highest, Parama, in relation to sense control, Vajyata Indram, Vyasa contrasts it with various other lesser forms of sense control. Some hold, he says, that sense control means enjoying sense objects as long as they are not prohibited. Others, 
that sense control means contact with sense objects according to one's desire rather than according to the dictates of the senses, and still others, that sense control involves engaging with sense objects but without attachment or aversion, happiness, or distress. Real sense control, however, says Vyasa, reiterating the previous sutra, is when the mind is restrained and focused because then the senses are automatically brought under control. The problem with the other opinions noted by Vyasa, says Vekaspati Misra, is that they all still involve contact with the sense objects, and sense objects are like poison, there is always the danger of being overcome by them. Even the greatest expert in the science of poisons, he says, does not sleep with snakes without fear there is always the danger of being bitten. Therefore, the highest sense control is that in which there is no engagement whatsoever with sense objects, and this occurs when the mind is withdrawn from the senses. Vijanabhika refers to the story of sage Sabhari related in the Bhagavata Pura, 9. 6.40 ff. In an attempt to avoid the lure of the senses and the distractions and temptations of the world, the sage was practicing austerities under the waters of the river Yamuna, which provides, as an aside, an example of the fourth stage of Brahma outlined above, allowing him to suppress his breathing for as long as he willed and thus survive peacefully in environments normally inhospitable to human survival. However, even in this most removed of environments, the sage's mind was not fully under control, and so he became distracted by a pair of fish mating. Witnessing this act, the sage became overwhelmed with sensual desires, abandoned his asceticism, and turned his attention to conjugal indulgence. From the perspective of yoga psychology, although the sage had mastered great lofty attainments in terms of prima, his siddhan nonetheless contained unlimited saskras from previous lives, including saskras of previous sexual experiences. By meditating underwater, the sage had tried to remove himself from any possible temptation that might awaken these, but these dormant sexual saskras were nonetheless activated by the slightest external sexual stimulus, in this case, mating fish. Vijanabhiku introduces a theistic element here by quoting the Gita, the senses are so agitating, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind even of a person who is struggling to control them. But a person who restrains all of them and remains with mind fixed on Mika as the supreme with senses under control, has steady knowledge, too. 60. Ramnanda Sarasvati gives the example of Siddha from the Ramayaya as one who had mastered the highest sense control. Siddha's mind was so fixed on her husband Rama, that, even though abducted and in captivity, she was immune to all the lures of the powerful demon Ravat who was trying to seduce her. Here we see that, in the more isvara, focused theologies of the theistic traditions, rather than trying to suppress all one's past saskras exclusively by one's own will and meditative prowess, and thus run the risk of past saskras reactivating as was the case with the sage Sabhari, the yogi instead saturates the mind with devotional saskras related to thoughts directed to the divine form and activities of God, isvara. This is a more theologically elaborate expansion of Patanjali's Isvara, Pradna, based on the idea that rather than exclusively suppressing negative mundane saskras, one strives to replace them with transcendent ones, a theistic variant of the Pratipaka, Bhavna from 2. 33. Iti Patanjali, Virasite Yoga Sutra Dvaishya Sadhana, to thus ends the second chapter on Sadhana in the Yoga Sutras composed by Patanjali. Chapter Summary The chapter begins with an introduction of Kriya, Yoga 1, its effects 2, and a discussion of the Klesas, which it removes 3 to 11. Karma and its consequences are outlined 12 to 14 and the principle of suffering established 15 to 16. This is followed by the characteristics of the seer and the scene 17 to 22, the conjunction between them 23 to 24, and the definition of liberation 25 to 27. Next, the eight limbs of yoga are introduced as the means to attain liberation 28 to 29, and the remainder of the chapter is dedicated to these, the yamas and their universality 30 to 31, the niyamas 32, 
the means to counter tendencies contrary to the Yamas and Nyamas 33 to 34 and the side. Benefits accruing from observing them 35 to 45. Next, Asana, the third limb, is presented 46 to 48, followed by Brima, the fourth limb 49 to 53, and Pratyahara, the fifth 54 to 55. Triya Bhuti, Puta Chapter 3 Mystic Powers 3. Vandasa, Vandasitajya Dridasa, Place, Vandha, Bound, Fixed, Sitajya, Of the Mind, Dra, Concentration Concentration is the fixing of the mind in one place. Patanjali discussed the first five of the eight limbs of yoga in the previous chapter and now concludes his discussion of the remaining three. Since the eight limbs of yoga would seem to constitute one discrete, self, contained unit in terms of subject matter, the question can be raised as to why Patanjali chose to divide the limbs over two distinct chapters. The classical commentators do not draw attention to this, but an answer, I suggest, lies in three. Four below. The primary subject matter of this chapter is the buddhis, sthis, the mystic powers, and these are attained by performing sayama on various objects. 3. 4 defines sayama as a progressive application of the last three limbs of yoga. Hence, these three limbs are situated prior to the presentation of sayama, which in turn is pivotal to an understanding of the mystic powers, and thus is the central theme of the rest of the chapter. Moreover, Patanjali considers the five previous limbs of yoga to be the external limbs and the final three limbs of yoga discussed here to be internal, 3. 6. A division that further contributes to a logic of separation into different padas, chapters. In fact we have seen a gradual progression from the external to the internal throughout the limbs. The yamas are the most external, proscribing relations with other beings one doesn't inflict violence, lie, steal, sexually exploit, or covet the possessions of others. The Nyamas deal more internally with one's own practices, but practices still related to external elements hygiene, contentment with one's situation, curbing sensual involvement, study, and devotional activity. Asanas focus exclusively on one's personal body, and Prima, more internal still, on the breath within the body. Pratyahara continues this progression of internalization by going still deeper within by withdrawing consciousness itself from the senses. This process of consecutive stages of internalization continues throughout the remaining three limbs. Dra, concentration, Patanjali states, involves fixing the mind on one place, Disa, Bandha. In the Mahabharata, two passages outline seven or ten different types of dras, respectively, as does the Murgaya Pura 30. 44 to 45, which can be directed toward parts of the anatomy or external objects and result in wonderful powers similar to those that will be described later in this chapter. One Vyasa seems have these passages in mind when he mentions the circle of the navel, the lotus in the heart, two, the light in the brain, three, the tip of the nose, for the tip of the tongue, or any external object as a place upon which the mind can be fixed. Although Patanjali does not specify the nature of the object upon which Dra is to be performed, Vaikaspati Misra and Ramnanda Sarasvati quote a series of verses from the Vyupara, 6. 7.77-85, that recommend theistic meditation on the form of Vayu on the grounds that since concentration requires an object, when one concentrates on the beautiful personal form of the Lord, one has no desire to think of anything else, since nothing else can compete in attractiveness. The mind is thus spontaneously fixed. This type of meditation is often referred to as essay, gua, wherein the personal form of God is the object of meditation, and is typical of the Indian theistic traditions. The passage chosen by the commentators gives a good illustration of the particulars of this type of meditation, one should thus meditate on Hari's Vyu's pleasing face, his beautiful lotus eyes, his gorgeous cheeks, his broad and shining forehead, and his ear lobes, which wear charming earrings. His neck is like a conch shell, his broad chest is marked with the tuft of hair called Srivatsa, and his belly has a deep navel and three folds. 
He has four arms, his thighs and legs are symmetrical, and he has beautiful lotus feet. He wears a spotless yellow garment, is adorned with a crown, attractive armlets and bracelets, and holds his ragaba, discus, club, sword, conch and rosary. 5. He is Brahman, the absolute truth, and the yogi should try to concentrate the mind until it is fixed on him alone. As we have seen, Vaikaspati Misra provides a parallel illustration of Sikwa meditation on Lord Shiva in his commentary on I. 38. Dealing with the yogic dream state. 3. 2. Tatra Pratyaya Ika, Tanadatayanam Tatra, there, in that, Pratyaya, conception, idea, thought, e.k.a., Tanata, fixed on one point only, Tayanam, meditation. Meditation is the one, pointedness of the mind on one image. Patanjali now defines the seventh limb of yoga, Tayana, meditation, which Vyasa describes as the continuous flow of the same thought or image of the object of meditation, without being distracted by any other thought. As has been discussed, Pratyaya used by Patanjali here refers to the image or impression that an object in this context, the object of meditation makes on the mind. When the image of the object of meditation flows uninterruptedly, e.k.a. Tanada, in the mind, that is to say when the mind can focus exclusively on that object without any other distraction, Tayana, has been achieved. The sixth and seventh limbs of yoga and, as will be seen below, the eighth as well, are not different practices as is the case with the previous five limbs, but a continuation and deepening of the same practice. As Al, Biruni puts it, they are like the progression between infancy and maturity. 6. Hari Harananda points out that the difference between these limbs of yoga is only one of degree, in concentration, the attention on the object is intermittent or distracted, in meditation, it is unbroken and indistracted. Meditation, he states, is when the mind flows on the object of thought without any interruption, like the smooth and even flow of oil or honey, which pours forth in one thick, uninterrupted stream. Concentration, the previous stage, is more like the uneven trickle of water that flows in a series of distinct droplets, each one similar but interrupted by gaps. Hence, this sutra is distinguished from the previous one by the use of the term e.k.a. Tanada, the state of retaining one image in the mind, that is, fixing the mind on one place. Vijanabhiku states that karana, concentration, can be disrupted if the senses come in contact with objects that are extremely dear to the practitioner, but this does not occur in Tayana when one is fully absorbed, just like the arrow, maker, his whole being engrossed in the arrow, who was not aware of the king passing by his side. Skisutras. 7. We can note here that Tayana was used in older Indic texts as a synonym for Samadhi, the culmination of the meditative process, rather than the penultimate limb, as we find here. In fact, Samadhi does not occur in the older Upanishads prior to the Maitreya 8. In the Mahabharata and early Buddhism, Tayana denoted the goal of yogic practice, as touched upon in I. 17 and the same understanding seems to have been the case with the Upanishads, Svetasvatarai, 3, and the Gita, 13, 24. As a point of interest, we include here the section of the Mahabharata that describes the eight-limbed practice of yoga which it calls the yoga with eight characteristics, a.a., gua, as an example of how an important pre Patanjali source renders the system. Sage Ijanavakaya to King Janaka I have spoken to you about the knowledge of Skya, now hear from me about the knowledge of Yoga as I have heard and seen it, O best of kings. There is no knowledge equal to Skya, there is no power like that of Yoga. Both of these are the same path, both are said to lead to immortality. Only people lacking wisdom say that these are different. But we, O King, see them as one without any doubt that which the yogis perceive, the followers of Skya experience. One who sees that Skya and Yoga are one, is a seer of truth. Know that the control of the vital airs to be the highest practice in Yoga, O chastiser of the enemy. In fact, 
in their very same body, yogis can wander around the ten directions. 9. When death occurs, my dear king, having abandoned the physical body, such yogis wander happily around the worlds in the subtle body, endowed with the eight yogic powers, was, 10 O sinless one. In the Vedic scriptures, the wise speak of yoga as having eight qualities, 11 and bestowing eight subtle powers. 12 It is this and nothing else, O best of rulers. They say that the topmost practice of yoga is of two kinds, according to what is revealed in the scriptures, yoga with qualities and yoga without qualities. 13 There is concentration of the mind dra, C3. 214, and there is Priyama 2. 49 FF. Priyama is Sigwa, Andra is Nirgwa. It is seen that exhaling air in the practice of Nirgwa, O Lord of Maithila, causes an excess of wind. Because of this, it should not be practiced. Twelve ways of restraining the breath in the first watch of the night are recorded in the scriptures. After sleeping in the middle watch, the Twelve ways of restraining are prescribed again for the final watch. Living in solitude, tranquil, and controlled, one should without doubt engage one's Atman in yoga with the intelligence, delighting in the Atman and living in solitude. One should cast off the fivefold faults of the five senses, sound, form, touch, taste, and smell Pratyahara too. 54. One should restrain the state of Pratipham, Apavargam, 15 and fix the senses on the mind, Manas. The Manas should then be fixed on the ego, Ahakra, O Lord of Men, the Ahakra on the intelligence, Budhai, and the Budhai, in turn, on Prakti. After undertaking this progression, one should meditate on the Purua, which is autonomous, Kevalam, 2. 25. A spotless lotus, eternal, infinite, pure, unblemished, immovable, existent, indivisible, beyond decay and death, everlasting, immutable, the Lord and imperishable Brahman. Consider now, O King, the characteristics of the yogi. The character of the yogi displays a tranquility like that of the contented person sleeping blissfully. The wise speak of the yogi as like the upward motionless flame of a lamp full of oil burning in a windless place. The character of the yogi is like a rock, which is incapable of being moved even when pummeled by torrents of rain pouring down from clouds. The demeanor of the yogi is not moved by the noise of assorted conches and drums being played together, nor by outbursts of song. Just as a person of composed nature might ascend a staircase while holding a container full of oil, and yet, despite being alarmed upon being attacked by assailants armed with swords, does not spill a drop out of fear of them, so, in the same way, the mind of one who is absorbed in the Supreme, is fully concentrated. These are the characteristics of the sage yogi, which are displayed due to resolve and to controlling the activities of the senses. Absorbed in the Self, the yogi beholds the Supreme and Imperishable Brahman, resembling a lamp situated in dense darkness blazing forth. It is in this way that, after the passage of much time in practice, the yogi enters the state of transcendent liberation, Kevala, upon leaving the body, O King. This is revealed in the eternal scriptures. This, indeed, is the yoga of the yogis. What else is the character of yoga? Knowing this, the wise consider that they have accomplished the goal of life. 3. 3 Tad of Artha, Madra, Nirvasam Svarapa, Sunyami Vasamdi Tad, that the practice of Dhyana from the previous sutra, Eva, the same, the very one, Artha, object, Madra, alone, Nirvasam, shining forth, Svarapa, own form, own self, Sunyam, devoid of, Eva, as if, Samdi, Meditative absorption samadhi is when that same dhyana shines forth as the object alone and the mind is devoid of its own reflective nature. Patanjali here reaches the final limb of yoga, samadhi. We can note that only one sutra has been dedicated to this ultimate stage, despite its status as the goal of the entire system, because Patanjali presented the various stages of samadhi in the first chapter, 
and the commentators have already discussed these in some detail there. He therefore here merely needs to connect that discussion with the eight limbs of yoga by situating samadhi in its place here as the eighth and final limb. We can also note that, out of the seven different types of samadhi discussed in that chapter, chapter, Patanjali seems to have defined samadhi here in terms similar to his description of nirvitarka, samadhi in I. 43. Vyasa states that when the mind is so fully absorbed in the object of meditation that it loses all notions of itself as a self, conscious, reflective mind, svarupa, sunyam, one has reached the state of samadhi. In this state, the mind is no longer aware of itself as meditating on something external to itself, all distinctions between the yogi as the subjective meditator, the act of meditation, and the object of meditation have disappeared. In other words, any subconscious awareness, however subtle, that I am meditating on this object ceases. Also, as Bhojaraja reminds us, from the threefold aspect of knowledge the object itself, the name of the object, and the idea of the object in a person's mind the latter two are eliminated in the samadhi referred to here, and only the object itself occupies the yogi's awareness exclusively. There is no mental recognition of what the object is, the object as raw uninterpreted presence now constitutes the yogi's entire universe of experience, shining forth in its own right, artha, matra, nirvasam. The commentators reintroduce the example of a pure crystal which, when placed next to a red flower, appears to completely lose its own character by reflecting the form and color of the flower exclusively. Meditation has reached a height such that the yogi is no longer self, aware and is conscious only of the object of meditation rather than of its function or relevance in the scheme of things, and it is in this level of intensity that samadhi differs from dhyana. There is thus a progression of concentrative absorption on the object of meditation in the last three limbs of yoga, from dra, through dhyana, to samadhi. In the previous verse, we included the Mahabharatas, pre, Patanjali rendition of the practice of yoga with eight characteristics as a point of contrast with Patanjali's systematized version. We noted in 2. 28 that the technical and esoteric eightfold stages of classical yoga are brought colorfully to life in the popular narratives that form the core of real, life Hindu religious identity in texts such as the Bhagavadapura, arguably, along with the Ramaya, the most popular source of religious narrative in the Indian subcontinent. 16 before moving into the entirely new direction that the sutras are about to take for the remainder of this chapter, we conclude this section on the eight limbs of yoga with another version of the eight, limbed practice of yoga, this time from the Bhagavadapura, 3. 28.1 ff, to illustrate how this practice with Isvara as the Alambana, meditational support, I. 10, for the mind is construed in the Bhakti traditions. The discussion is relevant to the yoga tradition as it transpires between Kapila, the reputed founder of the Ski tradition, considered an incarnation of Vayu in ancient sources 17, and his mother. The Lord, Bhagavan, 18 said, O daughter of the king, I will outline the characteristics of Sabaja, Yoga, 19 by this method, the mind becomes joyful, and undoubtedly attains the path of truth. One should follow one's Dharma duty, 20 to the best of one's ability, and refrain from activities opposed to dharma. Content with what one has attained by providence, one should worship the feet of a spiritual teacher, 21 one who has perceived the Atman. Ceasing mundane religious activities, 22 but rather being attracted to the dharma which leads to liberation, one should always eat a limited amount of pure food, and reside in a peaceful, secluded place. One should practice non-violence, as, truthfulness, satya, non, stealing, astya, and adopt only as many possessions as required, yavad, artha, paragraha. One should practice celibacy, brahmacharya, austerity, tapas, cleanliness, sasaya, study, svadhyaya, and worship the supreme being, purarkana. 23 Observing silence, one should become fixed in a sitting posture by mastering the appropriate asanas, 
gradually mastering breath control, pra, and practicing withdrawal of the senses from sense objects, pratyahara, with the mind fixed on the heart. One should fix the breath on one of the chakras 24 of the body with one's mind. One should contemplate the activities of Lord Vayu and become absorbed, samadhana, in that way. By these and other processes, alert, and with controlled breath, one should gradually fix one's mind, which is prone to corrupt and unspiritual ways, with one's intelligence. Once one has mastered asana one should establish a seat, asana, in a clean place, and sitting comfortably, with the body erect, one should perform practice. One should cleanse the passageway of the air by performing pura, kum haka, rikeka breath restraints 25 or by the reverse processes, such that the siddha can become fixed and indistract. The mind of the yogi whose breath is controlled should soon become purified, just as iron, melted by fire and fanned by wind, releases its impurities. By Brahma one can burn imperfections, 26 Bhidra, one's sins, by Pratyahara, contact with sense objects, and by Dhyana, ungodly tendencies. When one's mind is perfectly controlled by the practice of yoga, with one's gaze fixed on the tip of the nose, one should meditate on the form of God, Bhagavan. He has pleasing lotus, like features, with reddish eyes like the interior of a lotus, and is dark like the petals of a blue lotus. He bears a conch, discus and club. His shiny silken garments are yellow like the filament of a lotus, the cow stub hajul adorns his neck, and the mark of Srivatsa his chest. 27. His neck is encircled by a forest garland with intoxicated humming bees swarming about it, and he is adorned by a magnificent necklace, bracelets, helmet, armlets, and anklets. His hips are adorned with a brilliantly shining girdle, and he is seated in the lotus of the heart. His countenance is serene and he has the most beautiful appearance, gladdening the eyes and the mind. He is eternally gorgeous to behold, and is worshipped by the entire universe. He has the youthful vigor of the prime of youth, and is anxious to bestow his blessings upon his devotees. The glories of this exalted person are worthy of recitation in hymns, and bring renown to pious people who glorify him. One should perform meditation, dhyana, upon the entire form of the Lord, until the mind no longer deviates. A person, at this point, with heart flowing with love for the Lord, Hari, Bhagavan, with hair standing on end from ecstasy, and constantly overwhelmed with streams of tears from intense love, gradually withdraws the hook of the Siddha. 28 At this stage, the mind suddenly attains liberation, nirva, and enters the state of freedom, detached and without objects, like the flame of a lamp when it is extinguished. Freed from the flow of the Gwas, one now perceives the Atman, fully manifest and autonomous. The Yogi, as a result of this supreme dissolution of the mind, becomes situated in the wonders of the Atman, and, attaining the nature of the higher self, realizes that the cause of the experiences of pleasure and pain, Tukka, that he had previously attributed to his own self, were actually occurring in the Ahakra, which has no ultimate and enduring reality. 3. 4. Trayam Ekatra Sayama Trayam, 3. Ekatra, together, Sayama, Sayama when these three are performed together, it is called Sayama. Returning to Patanjali's more frugal sutras, this verse informs us that Vendra, Dhyana, and Samadhi are performed together, Ekatra, on an object, the act of concentration is called Sayama. Vyasa uses the term Tantrika to describe this, and, Certainly, the tantras are a body of texts that, among other things, deal with the types of mystic powers that occupy the bulk of this chapter. The commentators simply state that rather than laboriously list all three each time Dra, Dhyana, and Samadhi are to be performed together, Patanjali has introduced a technical term, Sayama, to refer to the application of the three of them in sequence. Hari Harananda raises the obvious question, why are Dra and Dhyana relevant at all at this point, since they are already superseded by the time one attains Samadhi? 
His reply seems to be that all three types of contemplation are required in order to know an object thoroughly in all its aspects. 29 Another explanation might be that one would assume that the yogi, at least most yogis, cannot just snap instantly into a state of samadhi. The mind first has to be gradually eased away from external awareness and progressively stilled through the stages of dra and tayana. Thus the yogi sits down to meditate and, applying dra in the transition period from conventional awareness to the concentrated state, progressively focuses the mind until samadhi is attained. 3. 5. Taj, Jade Prajlika Tad, that, Jade, from mastery, prajna, wisdom, loka, vision, light from sayama comes insight. The commentators have little to say here except that as one becomes fixed in sayama, so one becomes immersed in the wisdom of samadhi, prajnaloka. Various levels of insight involving prajna have been discussed previously, I. 20. 48 to 49, 2. 27, as have the various stages of samadhi in the first chapter. 3. 6. Tejya Bhidmiu Vinayaga Tejya, it's Bhidmiu, on the stages or planes, Vinayaga, application Sayama is applied on the different stages of samadhi. One must proceed along each plane of samadhi consecutively, says Vyasa. One cannot skip a step with one's eye on a higher stage and expect to attain the insight mentioned in the previous sutra. No one who sets off for the river gag from Silareta, says Vakaspati Misra, reaches there without passing across the Meghavana. An archer can pierce more subtle targets only when he has mastered larger ones, says Vijanabhiku, and one can climb stairs only step by step. In short, yogic insight is attained in stages. The only exception to this progression recognized by the commentators is for one who has attained the higher stages by the grace of God, Isvara. For such a person, the accomplishments of the lower stages are automatically achieved. Otherwise, it is only by the practice of yoga itself that one knows what the next stage is, according to Vyasa. Or, inversely, sometimes, by trying to fix one's mind on a higher stage, one realizes that one is actually qualified only for a lower stage, says Vijanabhiku. 3. 7. Trayam enter, Agapir Vebya Trayam, 3. Enter, internal, Agam, limbs, Pir Vebya, then the previous ones these three Dra, Tayana, and Samadhi are internal limbs compared to the previous limbs of Yoga. It is the three limbs involved in the process of Sayama, here called internal, enter, that primarily occupy the attention of Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, not the five external limbs, says Vakaspati Misra, even though all eight limbs of Yoga are essential ingredients. Al. Biruni states that internal means more removed from the senses, 30 Vijanabhiku says that internal refers to the purification of the mind, and external to the purification of the body. Certainly the higher states cannot be attained without practicing the yamas and niyamas. Nonetheless, although indispensable, the former limbs are only indirectly relevant to meditation, says Vijanabhiku, the latter are directly relevant. However, as always in the Indic traditions, there is room for rare exceptions, and Vijanabhiku notes that certain elevated souls like Jabharata directly attain the stage of Sayama simply by virtue of their yogic practices in former lives, without the need to practice the other limbs of yoga in this life. In the Bhagavata Pura, v. 7-14, Jabharata had been a king named Bharata in a previous life. When the time was appropriate, he gave responsibility for his kingdom to his sons and betook himself to the forest to fix his mind on Lord Vayu without distraction, as per the Puric ideal. One day, as he was sitting in his hermitage, he witnessed a pregnant deer, startled by a nearby lion, leap over the stream where she had been drinking and prematurely deliver her offspring as she leapt, which fell into the river. When the poor deer died from the sheer trauma and exhaustion of the incident, the kind-hearted Bharata felt impelled to save the helpless newborn deer drowning in the current. Adopting the orphaned fawn, the saintly king nourished it, protected it, and ended up so completely attached to it that he became diverted from his worship and yogic practice, 
to the point that he was found absorbed in thought of the deer when death came to claim him at his given time. In resonance with the Gita, 8. 6, where K states that one will attain after death whatever state of being one remembers when one leaves one's body, Bharata was reborn as a deer. However, because he had, after all, performed years of yoga practice and devotional worship in his previous life, he retained full awareness and past remembrance of the events that had caused his present situation despite being bound in the body of a deer. He thus waited until the karma responsible for this condition was exhausted and death came once more to remove him from this dear birth. Again in resonance with the Gita, 6. 42-43, which states that unsuccessful yogis take rebirth in a pious family where they again take up their practices from wherever they had left off in their past life, Bharata was next reborn in the family of a pious Brahma, endowed once more with recollection, this time of his past two births. Determined never again to fall prey to attachment, he postured to the world as an insane mute, so that people would ignore and shun him. Although a fully self-realized yogi, Bharata wandered around naked and unkempt, completely disassociated from his bodily functions and social norms. Vijanabhika thus refers to him to illustrate someone who had attained the highest level of samadhi without the need for cultivating the previous limbs of yoga in his present life, but, obviously, Bharata had already performed these in his previous life. The point is that the goal of yoga is samadhi, and Vijanabhika goes on to quote the Garuapara, 31 which states that asanas and such external practices, in and of themselves, do not lead to the goal of yoga, indeed, these can be impediments to the real goal of yoga. Akara quotes a similar verse in this regard, that asanas alone do not produce the goals of yoga, samadhi meditation does, and nothing else. Vijanabhika draws from another story from the Bhagavata Pura, X. 74.46, where the proud and envious Sasukala, who had never performed any type of yoga practice, attain the supreme goal of meditation simply because his mind was fixed undeviatingly on Ka. Even though his absorption was out of obsessive hatred for Ka, it nonetheless fulfilled the ultimate requirement of Samadhi, namely, undeviated concentration. 32 Again, the point is that real yoga means meditative absorption on one object. Vijanabhika quotes the series of verses from the Bhagavad Gita where Ka lays out something of a hierarchy of yoga practice, Fix your mind on me alone, absorb your intellect in me. You will thus dwell in me without a doubt. If you are not able to fix the mind on me in samadhi, then, O Arjuna, desire to reach me by engaging in abhyasa, yoga, the yoga of practice see Patanjali I. 12 ff. If you are incapable of practicing abhyasa, yoga, then be intent on performing dutiful activity for my sake. 12. 8 to 10, the goal here is clearly expressed as absorption, in this case Anka. Abhyasa, or practice, is relevant only to achieve this state. The Abhyasa referred to Bhika here, says Vijanabhiku, is the same Abhyasa mentioned earlier in the Yoga Sutras, I. 13. The effort to be situated in steadfastness. 3. 8 Tad Api Bhayar, a Ganir Vijayajya Tad, these, API, even, Vahi, external, Agam, limbs, near Vijayajya, to Siddha Samadhi yet even these are external limbs in relation to Siddha Samadhi. This sutra indicates that Dra, Dhyana, and conventional Samadhi, although internal when compared to the first five limbs of Yoga, are themselves considered external, Bayar, in relation to the highest type of samadhi known as nirbhaja. Even the last three limbs involve focusing the mind on an object and, of course, both the mind itself and all its objects are pyrktic, and therefore external, from the perspective of purua. Nirbhaja, samadhi comes about only when all eight limbs of yoga have reached their conclusion, says Vyasa. There are thus three subdivisions in the path of yoga outlined by Patanjali in these sutras, the first five limbs are indirect or preparatory causes of samprajanata, samadhi, the three remaining limbs are direct causes of samprajanata, samadhi, and, finally, 
the ultimate goal is Asamprajanata, Samadhi. 3. 9. Vyathana, Naraha, Seskraya Abhibhava, Pradurbhava Naraha, Siddhan Vayo Naraha, Parama Vyathana, Outgoing, Emerging, Naraha, Suppression, Restraint, Control, Seskrayo, of the subliminal imprints, Abhibhava, Overpowering, Suppression, Disappearance, Pradurbhava, Manifestation, Appearance, Ka, Instant, Moment, Siddha, Mind, Anvaya, Connected, Proceeding, Naraha, Suppression, Parama, Development The state of restraint, Naraha, is when there is disappearance of outgoing I.E. Worldly Saskras and the appearance of restraining Saskras. These emerge in the mind at the moment of restraint. In this sutra, as well as 3, 11 and 12 below, Patanjali speaks of three types of parama, transformations. Transformations or developments of the mind. Since change and movement at every moment are the very nature of the gwas, says Vyasa, the question arises as to what type of change takes place during the moments when the mind is restrained, which by definition should entail no change or movement at all. In other words, the gwas are always in flux, and since the gwas underpin the entirety of prakti and consequently everything emanating from her, everything in manifest reality is therefore constantly in motion. This includes the mind, which, as we know, is also pirktic. If the mind, like all pirktic products, is by its very metaphysical nature constantly in motion and changing because of the ever, shifting was that constituted, how is it possible to still the mind? This would seem to be inherently impossible. The mind is made of saskras, and Vyasa, following Patanjali in the Sutra, divides these into two basic types, Vyathana, outgoing saskras, that propel the mind into any kind of activity, and Naraha, restraining saskras, which are activated in meditation and restrain the outgoing saskras. Patanjali is now providing more detailed and subtle information as to the mechanics underpinning the state of Siddha, Vitti, Naraha that he established as the goal of Yoga. Specifically, Naraha is attained by Naraha, Saskras. According to the psychology of Samadhi, when the yogi sets about meditating, what is actually occurring is that a restraining Naraha set of Saskras is being cultivated to suppress the normal flow of mundane outgoing, Vyathana, Saskras active in the turmoil of everyday thought. Thus, when the mind is active and roaming about as in normal consciousness, the restraining Saskras are latent and therefore absent, and when the restraining Saskras are active and dominant, the outgoing ones are being suppressed. The idea is that there is always an ongoing dynamic between these two, and therefore, even when the mind is restrained in meditation, there is a tussle between the restraining Saskras and the others, and consequently ongoing movement, albeit imperceptible to the meditator. In other words, on a metaphysical level, there is always movement in Prakti, however subtle, even when the mind appears to be completely restrained and fixed in the higher stages of Sabaja, Samadhi. Saskras are not destroyed, they are either active or latent, although, as we know, they can be weakened or burnt and thereby rendered impotent. Even when sense cognition, which produces Saskras, is checked, the store of Saskras from previous sense cognition does not just disappear, Saskras remain latent and can activate at any time the cloth is not destroyed when the weaver is absent, says Vekaspati Misra. By practicing meditation, the force or potency of the outgoing Saskras from the store of Saskras is gradually lessened, and the emergence and strengthening of Naraha ones increased. Increased although, as Vijanabhika points out, this is a gradual process that increases through practice. This dynamic between these two sets of Saskras is the movement that takes place during meditation. Therefore, at every moment of meditation, there is suppression of the latent outgoing Saskras and strengthening of the restraining Saskras that are performing this task of suppression. Harry Harananda compares it to the struggle of a spring under the stress of weight the springing potential of the spring does not disappear, it remains latent, but this occurs only when a constant restraining pressure is applied. 
the relationship between the two sets of saskras is thus never static. The reader can refer back to I. 18 for further discussion on this aspect of yoga. 3. Tantasya prasanta, vahita saskrit tasya, it's the minds, prasanta, peaceful, vahita, flow, saskrit, from subconscious impressions the mind's undisturbed flow occurs due to saskras. When one becomes proficient in cultivating the restraining saskras, say the commentators, the mind can then flow peacefully in meditation without disturbance, prasanta, vahita, that is, without being distracted by outgoing saskras. Contrarily, when these restraining saskras become weakened, they are overpowered by the outgoing saskras. Or, as Akara puts it, meditative absorption lasts for as long as the remaining saskras are not overcome by outgoing saskras. It is important to note that the restraining saskras are in actuality a continuous series of saskras. As will be discussed further below, the restraining, or any type of, saskras are actually an ongoing sequence of similar saskras, like a movie reel of identical stills. Nothing is static. Even in deep meditation, a continuous sequence of restraining saskras is in motion in the controlled mind. Hence Patanjali uses the term flow, vahita, in this sutra. One might note here, given the periodic statements in the texts to establishing the yoga position on mind and consciousness in distinction to the Buddhist one, as well as the dedication of a good portion of chapter 4 by Patanjali and the commentators to this end, that, at least on a surface level, both traditions do accept that external reality consists of a never-ending flow of interdependent, interconnected phenomena. For yoga, too, the saskras that comprise the siddha, as well as the us, the smallest physical subatomic particles of which the more physical aspects of prakti, the Mahabhudas, are composed, are constantly in motion in a successive flow, each individual saskrat or au arising and instantly being followed by a subsequent saskrat or au before disappearing. The difference is that in Akya, the saskras or as do not actually disappear but revolve back into their substratum, which is ultimately prakti. Prakti, like Purua, is an eternal substance with a permanent essence, an autonomous selfhood, to use typical Buddhist phraseology. That is to say, whereas its evolutions and permutations may be in constant flux and temporary, it has an independent essence, an eternal and constant self that is not metaphysically dependent on or interdependent with anything else. 33 As we know, in Buddhism, in contrast, there are no essential, autonomous, independent entities either spiritual or physical. Thus, while both traditions might agree on the basic flux of the surface level of reality, the flow of the sutra their differences lie in whether there is a permanent substratum that underpins it. For yoga, the two permanent and eternal substrata of reality are Puru on the one hand and Prakti on the other. 3. 11 Sarvartha take Gratheo Kayadeyo Sitajya Samadhi, Paramasarva, Artheta, focused on all objects, e.k.a., a Gratheo, focused on one object, Kya, destruction, Gudeyo, rise, Sitajya, of the mind, Samadhi, meditative absorption, Parama, transformation the attainment of the samadhi state involves the elimination of all pointedness i dot e wandering of the mind and the rise of one pointedness i dot e concentration vyasa notes that the nature of the mind is to be all pointed sarvartha that is scattered and roaming about anywhere and everywhere and thinking of all manner of random things in normal consciousness the propensity of the mind is ever restless and always thinking about sense objects, the past and future, worrying about this and that, etc. However, the mind also has an inherent potential of being one, pointed, e.k.a., agrata, or fixed on one object. When the latter propensity is developed to its highest potential, the state of samadhi is attained. Vekaspati Misra reminds us that nothing is ever destroyed when one of these propensities of the mind arises, that is, when one set of saskras discussed in the last verse activates, the other propensity always remains latent. 
Vijanab Hiku adds that changing the nature of the mind is a gradual process, it does not occur instantly, as anyone who has experimented with fixing the mind on one object for a prolonged period will know. 3. 12 Tatapana Santo de Tatulia, Pratyayo Sitajya Ikagratha, Paramitata, then, Pana, again, Santa, that which has been subdued, the past, Udita, that which has arisen, the present, Tulia, equal, Pratyayo, idea, image, Sitajya, of the mind, Ikagratha, one, pointedness, Parama, transformation in that regard, the attainment of one, pointedness occurs when the image in the mind that has just passed is the same as the image in the mind that is present. When one says that the mind is one, pointed or fixed, e.k.a. agrata, state the commentators, what is actually meant is that the previous cognition or image, pratyaya, in the mind that has subsided is identical to the cognition or image that succeeds it. This underscores the fact that the mind is never static but always flowing. Concentration involves replacing a previous mental image with the same image and so on in an ongoing series. This is like the role of the same identical image on the consecutive slides of a movie reel, thereby producing what appears to be a static picture but is in actuality a flow of identical but separate momentary images as one momentary image subsides, it is followed by another seemingly identical momentary image. One might object that this constant change of one image by another, albeit identical, image during meditation nonetheless means that the mind is in reality not actually fixed and unmoving at all, says Ramnanda Sarasvati, since these momentary images are constantly succeeding each other and thus coming and going in constant movement. This is technically correct, when we say that the mind is fixed in samadhi, we are being rhetorical. What this actually means is that, in meditation, the constant movement of the mind is focused on the same image it is one, pointed while during normal consciousness, the constant movement of the mind can randomly flit about and temporarily focus on anything at any given moment. As noted above, everything in prakti including the mind is constantly in motion because prakti is constituted by the guas, and the guas are in constant flux by their very nature. Technically, it is rajas that impels movement, both sattva and tamas are quiescent by nature. Without rajas there would be no motion in anything pirktik indeed, there would be no things emerging from prakti in the first place, since there would be no impetus to stir prakti into emergence. Since rajas is inherent in the very nature of prakti, everything is in constant motion. Motion once creation has been set in motion. Hence meditation is about keeping a flow of saskras fixed on an object, rather than a state of actual ontological stillness. Additionally, Vijanabhika does well to point out that while yoga is defined as siddha, vitti, naraya, technically speaking this entails all vittas other than the one solitary stable vitti containing the object of concentration. 34.3 13 at an abdendra udharma, lakavast, param vya with makron khya with makron ta with makron idana, by this, buddha, an object, indra you, the senses, dharma, nature, characteristics, lekha, qualities, temporal state, avastha, condition, state, param, development, change, vya with makron khya with makron ta with makron, is explained in this way, the change in the characteristics, state, and condition of objects and of the senses is explained. The above discussion on the changing states of the mind is also applicable to the senses and the sense objects, says Vyasa, in one of his longest commentaries on the sutras. Patanjali here essentially indicates that the constant change underpinning all manifest reality can be categorized according to Dharma, Lekha, and Avastha, characteristics, state, and condition. The commentators understand Dharma, the characteristics of an object mentioned by Patanjali in the Sutra, to be that which is specific and distinctive about that object. It can also refer to the function an object performs. Dharma has a variety of different but overlapping meanings in Hindu and Buddhist knowledge systems 35 perhaps the best, 
Known usage being that in the Bhagavad Gita where it refers to an individual's social duties or function in society as determined by the person's natural propensities, activities, and psychological inclinations or characteristics. 4. 13. This usage overlaps somewhat with the more metaphysical usage of the term here, insofar as it points to the specific inherent characteristics evidenced in an individual. For example, if clay, at a particular point in time, is made into a pot, it assumes the characteristics of being a pot rather than of being a cup or saucer and its function in the grand scheme of things is that it is a container for substances. The pot is thus a specific dharma that is potential in the clay, and the same clay can assume different dharmas by being transformed into other things such as saucers and cups. As will be discussed in the next verse, the clay is the dharman, literally, possessor of the dharmas, that is, the substratum or underlying substance. Along similar lines, gold bracelets, rings, bangles, or necklaces are dharmas of gold, which is the dharman. In parallel fashion, the lekha, or state, of an object is understood as its situation in time a pot can exist in the present, it could have existed in the past or, if yet to be made, exist at some point in the future. The avastha, the third item on Patanjali's list, is taken to refer to the condition of the pot whether in the past, present, or future, it could be a new pot in good condition, or an old pot, etc. All objects in manifest reality can thus be conceived of as undergoing constant change according to characteristics, state, and condition. The commentators connect these categories to the mind and the discussion in the previous sutras, the dharma of the mind at any given moment is all, pointed roaming about uncontrolled or one, pointed. This dharma, in turn, is qualified by lekha, temporal state the mind could have been one, pointed in the past, or be so in the future, for example, but not in the present. This, too, is qualified by condition understood in this context to refer to the fact that when the mind is 1. Pointed, its roaming potential is suppressed, and vice versa. The point in all this is that the guas, which underpin all reality whether of the nature of mind or pots, engage in ceaseless activity things are always changing from future to present to past, from old to new, from pots back into clay and then from clay anew into cups and saucers. But the underlying material substance does not change, only its characteristics, condition, and states change. The clay remains the underlying substance, even when transformed into items with specific characteristics such as pots and then again cups, and irrespective of the time and state in which these items are to be found at any given point. Similarly, the mind remains the same basic substratum whether one, pointed or not. If a gold vessel, says Vyasa, is melted and made into something else, it does not cease to be gold. Moreover, the gold in any particular object contains the potential of being molded into any other golden object that has been made in the past and might be made in the future. Therefore, in a sense, the past and the future are latent in the present. As the commentators put it, just because a man is interested in one woman at any point in time does not mean he is disinterested in other women, the potential for a change in interest is there, and this may have manifested in the past and may manifest again in the future. And again, along similar lines, a woman might be seen as a mother or daughter or sister or wife depending on context and relationship, just as an object might be perceived differently from different perspectives. But the essential woman herself remains the same, as does the underlying substance constituting all manifest objects. Patanjali has introduced this somewhat protracted philosophical discussion at this point in the sutras because there is an indispensable metaphysical dimension that needs to be established here. It is essential to grasp the underlying operative principles inherent in material reality according to the Skya and Yoga schools in order to understand the mechanics underpinning the Sthis, mystic powers, which will occupy most of the rest of the chapter. The Yoga school, along with the Skya school, subscribes to a metaphysical view called Satkarya, that any effect is present in its cause. For these schools, 
All manifest material reality is simply a transformation of the underlying cause, the Gwiza Prakti. All change, then, is simply a change of Prakti's characteristics, condition, and states. Das Gupta, using the language of loosening of Prakti's barriers that will be encountered in 4. 3, puts this as follows, production of effect only means an internal change of the arrangement of atoms as in the cause, and this exists in it in a potential form, and just a little loosening of the barrier which was standing in the way of the happening of such a change or arrangement will produce. Produce the desired new collocation the effect. This doctrine is called Sat Karita, Veda, I.E. That the Karita or effect is Sat or existent even before the causal operation to produce the effect was launched. 1922, 257, the difference between a banyan tree and a bed of roses or anything else is simply its configuration of Oz. When the tree dies, its constituent Oz dissolve back into Prakti, to reappear in new forms and configurations. One is reminded here of the famous verses in the Shandojya Upanishad, 6. 1.4 ff, it is just as from one lump of clay, one can understand everything made of clay, dear boy. The transformation of a clay object from clay is just a name, a verbal handle the reality is actually that it is just clay. It is just as from one copper object, one can understand everything made of copper, dear boy. The transformation of a copper object from copper is just a name, a verbal handle the reality is actually that it is just copper. It is just as from one nail cutter, one can understand everything made of iron, dear boy. The transformation of an iron object from iron is just a name, a verbal handle the reality is actually that it is just iron. In other words, we may call a clay object a pot or plate but essentially it is nothing but a transformation of clay. The names we apply to these transformations of clay are merely verbal handles. As a handle allows us to use the object to which it is attached, names allow us to refer to objects such that useful communication between individuals can take place. The same holds true for any object in Prakti. The yoga school thus demarcates itself from other schools such as Nyaya and Vaiyaka, which, as subscribers to the Asat Karya, Veda view, hold that the effect is not in. One single underlying substratum such as Prakti, as per the Sat Karya, Veda position, but rather in multiple distinct and separate causes, 36 or Buddhism, which holds that there are no ultimate, eternal, autonomous underlying substrata at all. Indeed, Yamashita, 1994, considers the specifics of Vyasa's comments here to be a direct refutation of the view of the fifth century Buddhist philosopher Vasubandhu in his Abhidharmakosa, Vya. It is important to keep the Buddhist challenge in mind given the counter-arguments that occupy a fairly significant portion of Patanjali's and our commentators' attention, especially, as we shall see, in Chapter 4. 37.3. 14 Santo Dittavyapadzaya, Dharmanupati Dharmai Santa, Ceased, The Past, Buddhita Arisen, The Present, Avyapadzaya, That Which Has Not Been Named, The Future, Dharma, characteristics, anupati, follows, is a consequence of, dharma, that which possesses characteristics, the substratum the substratum is that which underpins past, present, and future. Everything is essentially everything, says Vyasa, at least potentially, since ultimately Prakti and Hergwas are inherent and underpin all reality. Here, the same point is underscored, beneath all permutations of matter, whether past, santa, present, udita, or future, avyapadzaya, lies a constant substratum, dharman. In the last sutra, dharmas were discussed clay can be molded into objects displaying specific characteristics, dharmas, such as pots and plates. These dharmas are potential in the clay. The dharma, dharman 38, of this sutra is that which produces, literally, possesses, the dharmas, it is the substratum from which specific things with their own character evolve. The dharman underpins and remains common to all past, present, 
or future manifestations of its dharmas. So, in the example given above, the clay itself is the dharman, and the pots and plates produced from it in the past, present, or future, the dharmas. However, clay itself is a product of something subtler and more primordial, prakti, and thus clay and all objects in manifest reality are, in turn, themselves dharmas of a more subtle substratum, prakti herself, the ultimate dharman. Due to the conditions of time, space, and various other causal factors, this substratum, prakti, does not manifest everything at one and the same time saffron grows in Kashmir and not Pankala, the monsoon rains come in the summer and not the winter, and a deer gives birth to a deer and not a man, says Vekaspati Misra but this is due to different external factors and conditions, the same substratum remains. Therefore, everything is ultimately made of the same stuff and thus is essentially identical to everything else. The past is that which has performed its function and merged back into its substratum, the present is manifest at any given moment, and the future is that which exists in potential, sakti. Thus, says Pojaraja, since everything is essentially a temporary manifestation, dharma, a prakti, a cloth is essentially not different from a pot when considered from the perspective of its deepest metaphysical makeup. Or, as Akara puts it, the three worlds exist on a fingertip. This principle is essential in understanding, from the contours of skin metaphysics, the mechanics of the mystic powers that are to be discussed shortly in this chapter. Isvara, God, as well as advanced yogis who have mastered the techniques that will be encountered in the ensuing sutras, are believed to be able to remove what the commentators call the conditions what we might call the laws of nature that cause things to act according to what is considered to be their expected natures. Thus, since everything exists in potential form in prakti, by manipulating or rearranging the subtle substructure of physical reality and the normal conditions that historically or naturally operate on it in conventional reality, a yogi can cause matter to behave in what appears to be supernatural or miraculous ways. From the perspective of yoga metaphysics, however, there is nothing magical about such phenomena, once the skin physics underpinning reality is understood and the techniques for manipulating this reality outlined below are mastered. Specifically, as can be seen from the skit chart in the introduction, all gross physical objects in manifest reality according to the system are manifestations of Prakti's primary EVO elutes of mind Buddhai and Ahakra. These are universalized EVO elutes they underpin the universe of all manifest things but they also exist in individualized form each individual living being has its own Buddhai and Ahakra. An individual's Buddhai, according to the yoga school, is potentially universal, see the commentary on 4. 10, which can only mean that it can transcend its limitations and, in principle at least, merge with the cosmic or universal Buddhai underpinning all objects. Thus, once the Delhi-miting influence of the Klesas are removed, by the power of sheer concentration, the Yogi's mind can spill out beyond its individualized containment, reconnect with its universal potential, and consequently influence or rearrange the EVO elutes emerging from its macro nature as the universal mind. All this needs to be kept in mind when considering the mystic claims of the succeeding sutras, if we are to consider how sthis might appear rational and logical to a yoga philosopher. Before proceeding, Vyasa takes this opportunity to contrast the metaphysics of the yoga school with the Buddhist notion of kaika, veda, momentariness. According to almost all Buddhist sects, there is no underlying substance, dharman, that pervades the temporary forms and states of manifest reality. There is merely the momentary appearance of the characteristics, states, and conditions of three. Thirteen themselves. These are interdependent on each other, they cannot exist in isolation or independence. No autonomous permanent essence or substratum underpins them, either in the form of prakti and, by extension, its evolute of mind, or purua, reality is just a flow of ephemeral, connected moments of existence, all of them interdependent. Thus, while the Buddhists would accept the notion of the change in the characteristics, state, and condition of objects and of the senses from the previous sutra, 
they would consider these to be the ultimate nature of reality and not qualities of a dharman, substratum, prakti, as indicated in the sutra. There are no dharmins in Buddhism, only dharma, lakavasth, param, as per 3. 13.39 Vyasa presents one of the familiar orthodox Hindu arguments against this view, see, for example. Example, Vedanta Sutras 2. 2.25, how, from this perspective, does one account for memory? If objects previously seen are subsequently recognized, they must have been previously experienced. If previously experienced, there must be a constant substratum to the mind preserving the memory. Otherwise, if the mind changes at every instant and thereby becomes a different entity from one instant to the next, how would it recognize something recorded by the previous, and entirely different, mind? As Vekaspati Misra puts it, Yajnadatta does not recall something seen by Devdutta. The argument is taken up again in more detail in the next chapter. Vyasa also presents the common Hindu argument of karma against the Buddhist Kaika, Veda view. 40 If everything is constantly changing, then an actor who acts and thus plants a seed of karmic reaction one minute would not be the same person who would receive the fruit later. If personhood, along with everything else, is momentary, a different person emerges every moment. Thus, the person receiving the karmic fruit of action at the moment of its fruition would not be the same person as the original actor who merited such fruit. It would be like saying Devadutta receives the fruit of actions performed by Ketra. Where would be the moral justice in this? Further arguments differentiating yoga perspectives from mainstream Buddhist ones are presented in Chapter 4. 3. 15 Kramanyatvam Paramniyatvitukrama, Succession, Sequence, Anyatvam, Change, Parama, Transformation, Anyatv, In Change, Hitu, the cause the change in the sequence of characteristics is the cause of the change in transformations of objects. This sutra, immediately preceding the primary topic of this chapter, Sthis, mystic powers, reiterates the same basic point, Putanjali and the commentators are ensuring that the metaphysical infrastructure is in place for a correct understanding of the topic that occupies much of this chapter. The transformations, Parama, visible in an object are simply the result of the change in the sequence, krama, in that object's characteristics, state, and condition, clay powder, when water is added, becomes clay dough, which becomes a clay pot, which, when broken, becomes clay pot shards, which eventually become clay powder. All change is thus a sequence of characteristics, not a change of substance, in this case, clay, of course, as noted previously, clay itself in this example is in turn a characteristic of an even more subtle substratum, prakti, and her finer evo eludes, thus something can simultaneously be a substratum for further transformations and itself a transformation of a substratum even more subtle than itself. The same applies to temporal changes of state noted in 3. 13. The clay pot existing in the past has changed into the pot perceivable in the present, which will change into the pot that will exist in the future, but the substratum of clay remains constant. Changes of condition follow the same principle, a new pot gradually starts to become old in successive stages from the moment it comes into existence. Changes of condition, which occur every instant at the atomic level, are not perceivable moment by moment, but they are after the lapse of time one becomes gradually aware that something is becoming old and no longer new, if grain is left in a grain pit for a great number of years, says Vekaspati Misra, the structure of its particles becomes reduced to such a state that it will crumble into atoms upon being touched. Although it takes many years to approach such a state that is perceivable in this way, in actuality it is undergoing change in this direction every instant. Vijanabhika quotes Ka from the Bhagavadapura, actually, the bodies of all creatures are coming into existence and perishing at every moment by the force of time, but this is not perceived due to the subtle nature of time. 11. 22.42. In other words, since the Gwas underpinning Prakti are in constant motion, 
change is the inherent nature of all reality, whether physical or psychic. With regard to the mind, when considered as a substratum it can manifest two dharmas, or characteristics, which Sutra 3. 11 termed one, pointed or all, pointed, fixed, or distracted. As discussed in 3. 9. Another way of saying this is that the mind consists of either perceived or active cognitions, when the mind is outgoing or roaming about actively, or unperceived or latent impressions when all saskras or thoughts are suppressed and the mind is fixed, Vyasa here refers to seven characteristics of the mind 41. With this detailed metaphysical infrastructure in place, the subsequent sutras return to the topic of Sayama introduced in 3. 4 and its role in the development of mystic powers. 3. 16 Parama, Treya, Sayamd Adhait Nagata, Jainanam Parama, Transformation, Treya, Threefold, Sayamd, from Sayama, Adhaita, the past, Anagata, the future, Jainanam, knowledge when Sayama is performed on the three transformations of characteristics, state, and condition, knowledge of the past and the future ensues. This sutra introduces the first of the mystic powers. Powers that are achievable by advanced concentration and meditation, although mystic powers connected with the yamas and nayamas have already been touched upon in the previous chapters. Given the grandiose claims that are made in this chapter, it seems useful to begin with a statement of method. There are various methodologies and disciplines used in the academic study of religion that are especially pertinent when attempting to present or represent such things as mystical truth claims that at face value fall outside of the realm of empirical science as currently construed, or beyond the boundaries of human reason as understood in the context of post-enlightenment, rational thought. For example, the social, scientific approach favored by some scholars might attempt to explain paranormal claims not on their own terms but as the product of psychological or social forces at play on the psyche of the individual. It seems self-evident that individuals are inescapably influenced both by their greater personal, social, cultural, and historical context, and their individual psyches containing the total of formative life experiences, and that individual experience is mediated by or filtered through such constraints. Mystical truth claims that lie outside the boundaries of verifiable observation or reason are therefore explicitly or implicitly dismissed as inaccurate interpretations of experience stemming from such personal filters, and rational scientific explanations are sought by the scholar whose more objective vantage point is not impinged upon by the same historic, social, psychological influences. Other scholars find such reductionistic modes of interpretation problematic, not the least because they impose terms and categories on phenomena that are alien to the frame of reference of the system or body of knowledge in question. Moreover, they inevitably assume elitist perspectives, since they suppose that such socio-psychological forces were unknown to the hapless mystic who reported them, who consequently is implicitly construed as a victim of greater forces he or she does not understand or, indeed, is even aware of. More problematic is the assumption that these forces require the specialized and rational vantage point of the objective modern scholar to make sense of. And, of course, the limitations of the scholar's own rational or empirical worldview is also typically left unchallenged. Accordingly, a method or cluster of methods or approaches in interpretation loosely known as phenomenology developed which, despite meaning rather different things to different scholars, essentially refrains from forcing modern socio-scientific hermeneutical methods on religious truth claims. Some phenomenological approaches attempt to present such claims in their own terms and within their own context, without imposing on them interpretational models from a very different time and context, without judgment, and in as neutral a fashion as possible. One should note that phenomenology does not require the acceptance of the truth claims as necessarily true but attempts to suspend or avoid judgment on issues of validity or historicity or scientific accuracy. Some approaches in phenomenology stress empathy, and even participation, bracketing out one's own personal preconceptions as to what is real or true. Obviously, no one can be fully objective, 
but the attempt is made to situate oneself in the life, world of the other. Phenomenology concerns sympathetic representation and understanding of truth claims as accurately and objectively as possible within their own context as phenomena in their own right, so to speak and avoids making sense of them from the perspective of bodies of knowledge such as socio-scientific models alien to the system in question. This section, then, will be descriptive and attempt to represent the subject matter through traditional categories, although obviously. Obviously any attempt at descriptive representation is a priori an interpretation. The remaining sutras of this chapter contain claims that will seem astonishingly grandiose and fanciful from our modern perspectives. I will adopt some of the basics of the phenomenological method of interpretation here, as I have done throughout, but I will also attempt to make sense of these claims from within the parameters of the Ski school of metaphysics, in other words, as they might be conceptualized through traditional yogic perspectives. I thus take a different approach from much recent scholarship, even that penned by scholars otherwise highly appreciative of yoga's potential contribution to modern theoretical discussions of mind and consciousness but who clearly find this the section awkward, typically brushing it off as imagined, or attempting to rationalize it in some way. Expectedly, earlier, less sympathetic representations of yoga during the colonial period pointed to the sthis as grounds for a scathing dismissal of the entire system of yoga, the emaciated, bewildered ascetic, reduced to the dimmest spark of life, equally incapable for lack of energy of committing good or evil is, but a shrunken caricature of what man ought to be. The yogin, is much deceived in the magical powers he ascribes himself. His self, deception, the corresponding self, deception of the user of drugs, constitutes one of the most pathetic chapters of human history. To aim so high, and to fall so low, is in truth both deep tragedy and high comedy. Yet the stupefied yogin is one of the blundering heroes and martyrs who mark the slow progress of humanity. Luba 1919, 205, even genuinely sympathetic treatments of the sthis from this period attempted to rationalize them from within the contours of the knowledge systems of the day, as Landman tried to do by separating. Separating these powers which have some basis in scientifically established fact from those which have none, 1918, 134. One finds Landman struggling sincerely to accommodate as much from these claims as his post, enlightenment sensibilities allowed, referring to reliable accounts of yogis being buried alive from the pen of Sir Claude Martin Waite, who was an actual eye, witness and accepting the yogic claims of being able to enter another's body, 3. 38, as indivitably a case of hypnosis, 149. There has been outstanding recent work on the sutras, in contrast, which realizes the legitimate and inalienable place of the sthis in the system, Itachi. Witcher 1998, Feuerstein 1980. Feuerstein is right to adamantly point out that in the consensus of scholarly opinion, the supernatural attainments are discordant with Patanjali's rational approach and his philosophical objectives. However, the fact is that one-sixth of the aphorisms concerns precisely this recondite aspect of yoga, and one chapter, is actually entitled Buddhi, Buddha. How can we account for this obvious pre-eminence given to the magical side of the yogic path? Was Patanjali, after all, not such a staunch rationalist as contemporary interpreters have made him out to be? Has he perhaps unwittingly succumbed to the magical trend in yoga? betraying its putative shamanistic origins? These questions can all be instantly disposed of by the simple observation that the powers form an integral part of all yogic endeavor. 101 to 102, however, whether dismissive or accepting, very little effort has been directed toward attempting to provide a coherent explanation of how these these are not only a logical corollary of the parameters of Akin metaphysics 